Hey y'all, good evening. Happy Friday. So uh, I am definitely going to talk about my favorite watercolor supplies tonight and hopefully answer some of your questions. So hopefully you've got some questions. Um, but to kind of ease ourselves into it, I thought it would be kind of neat to like relax, get caught up, talk about what happened this week. And uh, I'm going to be refilling some of my Da Vinci watercolors because these are one of my favorites and I use them all the time. And uh, some of the colors are running kind of low. So talked about these here on the channel before. Oh, hey Liz, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm glad you can make it if you, if, even if only for a little bit. So one of the things I've been kind of thinking about, um, so this week my Instagram challenge went live. Um, I worked on that challenge from like the end of May to the beginning slash middle of June. So before Instagram announced that they were going to be prioritizing video even more, and I know a lot of artists have some very strong feelings about, about that announcement and about those changes. Um, I've shared a link to that tweet that one of the founders made in the paint box. Uh, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I know it's going to have a lot of impact for many. Art I mean, I feel like for me, ever since they introduced reels to begin with, um, Instagram has not really been that helpful for building an audience or getting my work in front of employers. Um, I mean, I think several of y'all probably feel the same way. Like it's hard to get your work in front of the people who are following you, let alone attracting new people. So I was really hoping that by jumping through all the hoops that Instagram said they wanted, that that's what they're looking for. Um, and they, they told several site, uh, sources that, the source I went with was Rainy Loon, since that was the one um, when she shared or when they shared all that, um, it definitely had artist Twitter in um, a flurry. Uh, that was like a year ago. Um, I, I was kind of hoping that if I did all of those things and gave it a month, so I actually gave it some time, it might fix things. I was kind of hoping I was the problem. Y you guys know what I mean? Um, and that it was like a fixable solution and that, that month, like Joseph will attest, that was a rough month. I was spending so much time on my phone, so much time on social media, just trying to keep up with the challenge and recording the challenge. Um, it was, it was definitely like a part-time job amount of work. And there wasn't really much to show for it. So while I'm filling watercolor pans, while we're waiting for people to kind of come in, if you guys have any questions about the challenge, if there was if there was stuff that maybe um, the long version of the video, which is on my Patreon, but it's set to public, so anybody can watch it. If there's stuff the long version didn't cover or that you have questions about, please ask, let me know. Um, there's some things I didn't necessarily go into a lot of detail because I, I thought people, I didn't know how interested people would be in some of the nitty gritty. Hey Nancy, uh, filing and paying bills. Oh, I'm so happy I can keep you company. I, I get that. That's why my the dining room, which is like where I do the craft stuff, is a disaster because I don't have any company <laughs> while I clean it. Hopefully I can rope somebody else into that. I tried to share, for the challenge, I tried to share everything I would have wanted to know. So that's why I got kind of granular, like talking about my game plan and how I planned on reutilizing certain, certain content and repurposing certain content. And that's why I, um, I, I didn't necessarily share every piece. I mean, they're there if anybody's curious about it. And um, I wasn't planning, like I think Swell, changed their Swell Entertainment, who I also was inspired by. I think she kind of changed uh, some of what she was posting. I didn't necessarily change the content of my art. I just changed, I, I did more reels, I did more IGTVs, that kind of thing. Um, oh, but 
I, I definitely can say that it wasn't, it, I learned a lot and there, it inspired some things, but I just, I don't necessarily think it was worth it. And I would not necessarily recommend another artist try that. Um, especially, you know, if you are using any other social media. Uh, yeah, it can become so, so. <laughs> Instagram is by far not my only social media. So I like I that was like kind of the point I made in the video too is like if Instagram is your only social media and your goal is to become an Instagram influencer, that might be different for you. But I I use it kind of like because I have an art station and I update that regularly and I share my art on Twitter and I share art on Facebook to an extent. I'm not as good at keeping up with Facebook as I used to be. Um, it just there isn't much of a return on investment for that. In fact, to be real, um, online never does as well for me as in person does for me in person does a lot better for me than online ever does and with the pandemic and not doing shows and not going out and meeting people and that kind of thing it it definitely and i'm not the only art i'm not pretending like i'm the only artist this is affected okay so don't take it that way at all um it, it forced me into a position i i knew i was not gonna succeed at and um that i really struggled with um I hadn't had a chance to watch the video, but I've taken a step back from social media in general. Yeah, um, I'm going to do that myself in uh, at the end of July, because our Joseph and my wedding anniversary is at the end of July, and then we're going on a family vacation in August, and then we're moving. So uh, I'm probably going to be very MIA towards uh, the end of the month myself. I just pop a real quick video on Instareal TV. Uh, we should set up a non-neurotypicals work along Zoom for tedious yet necessary chores. <laughs> yes, but it should be private because I don't, I, only us non-neurotypicals can, <laughs> I don't want to make it public because I'm, my stuff is such a mess and I always feel kind of like, well, y'all, y'all know how that is. The top, I know, right? This VCAM is so dumb because if I wear like cute headbands or animal ears or anything fun, VCAM is just like, no, 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 no one needs to see that. Does That's not, or that's not a thing. So I wanted to, to talk about the Instagram thing because um, it, it took a month of my life and uh, I kind of like, it was not a great experience and I'd kind of like, that's why it took me so long to edit it. I was like, oh, I don't want to go through all that footage. And, uh, so I edited it recently so it could go live on Tuesday and um, <clears throat> I'm just kind of reprocessing some of that. It's not really what I'm saying, Joseph. Honestly, if you like my art, Instagram will probably hide it from you. So if you like my art, let me grab my art station because um, at least art station is kind of more like DeviantArt it used to be where uh, they're not necessarily trying they're not gonna benefit from hiding my art necessarily so Ooh, it should it would be a ghost would be cute yeah yeah like a work along chat would be fun but i i can't necessarily say like art station has been um just like so much better for me either but at least it's not actually that's one more thing i want to talk to you guys about before we jump into the main meat of the stream and it's just mostly because it's been on my mind i've been thinking about it a lot so it's kind of like a solidarity thing i am finding that with social media whether it's instagram facebook twitter um, and these are platforms i've used for a long time i'm spending a lot of energy these days retweeting resharing posts just to get the same number of eyes I used to get like posting at 12 o'clock midnight on a whim. Um, and it's just kind of, I feel like I'm getting burnt out a lot these days and I'm getting burnt out very easily and very quickly um, because it is so much more work now for so little return on investment. And by that, I mean people looking at my stuff, the ability to attract clients, the ability to find longer term paying work. And I'm not bringing this up to just like 
wine, but I think other artists might be struggling with this as well. Um, and I just, I just wanted to like put it out there. Oh, I'm glad Instagram <laughs> shows. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Calvin brings up a good point in a way. Um, I'm going to take it in a different direction, but he was saying that Instagram at least shows him what I post, uh, and YouTube doesn't. Yeah. That's, that's like the, the fight I've been fighting all during the pandemic is that the social media platforms that I'm using aren't showing the things I make to people who are like subscribed or following. And it is so frustrating and so demoralizing. And I'm not like, I'm not trying to be like exactly. Yeah. So, so Liz gets it. Yeah. It isn't. No, it's not worth the burning out over. It is not worth it. And that's why I was mentioning like, I am taking, we ha I have a vacation planned. I will probably be gone for a month. Um, I'm not disappearing forever. It's just, uh, we're going to enjoy our anniversary and we're going to enjoy a family vacation and we're going to enjoy moving to our hopefully forever home. So um, I want to like leave that open and not be worried about keeping up with social media for that time span um, so that I can just enjoy that moment because I found that, I mean, I'm not an influencer and none of y'all are influencers in that regard. So I think y'all get what I'm talking about. We're artists and writers. And um, so we can't just post pictures of our vacation and that's our content. And there's nothing wrong with that if that is your content. I'm saying we often have to generate on top of that. And so it's just a lot, you know? Um, but yeah, I do plan on taking a break and um, I've just, I've just been going through these bad cycles of burnout this year where I'll get really burnt out and really depressed. And then somebody will say something very kind and it like reminds me like, you know, internet is not everything kind of thing. And I'll feel energized and charged up again. And then I'll get back on social media and get burnt out again. And, um, I, I want to like make it real crystal. Like for some people, I think social media works in their favor. And I have been that person in the past and I'm not that person right now. So you can be on both sides of the coin, but it's never our friend. You know what I mean? Like it's not social media, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, whatever, their goal is not to help us. Their goal is to make money off of our content in some way. So um, you can use that to your benefit. Right now, I think Instagram's making some choices that are making it, excuse me, very, very, very difficult for artists. And even as an artist who does create video content, it was really, really, really challenging for me to keep up. And um, that's not even talking about the app's flaws and the site's flaws and the inability to schedule content unless you have... Um, there's apparently other ways you can schedule to Instagram, but you can't use Instagram to schedule to Instagram. So that kind of thing. Hey Tanner, good evening. It's so hard to promote. It caters fast, fast, fast. Yeah, it does. It's kind of thing where if you want to succeed, you got to post every single day. Oh, not just every single day. I mean, more than that. Uh, and to be Instagram, you probably need to be wealthy to begin with. Cause yeah, 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 yeah. You need, it requires this. That was like the other takeaway from the, the two videos. Um, so my mom's side of the family has a lot of health issues and I help them out a lot and they live 30 minutes away and then they adopted a cat. So <laughs> like towards the end of the month, I just couldn't do all of it. So if you uh, take care of family or if you're raising a kid or multiple kids or if you work or anything like that, it's um, very difficult to be able to even just post every day because like where they live, they don't have good internet signal and Instagram, even for a video Instagram, or I'm sorry, a picture, Instagram is very finicky about internet connection. So what about people who live in countries where the whole country doesn't necessarily have the greatest internet signal, you know? And Nancy said after Facebook bought Insta, it went downhill fast. Yes. I'm, yes. 
uh, we're their product, not their partners. I wish I were more financially and math minded so I could figure out a way we creatives could self platform. Yeah, that's before I jump into the meat of tonight's stream. That is another thing I kind of want to touch on. So what a lot of other artists will say is you should have your own site. You should have your own mailing list. I have my own site. I have my own mailing list. I promote those all the time. There is still a breakdown somewhere. Um, that's not to like denigrate what you're saying, Nancy. Um, I agree with you. I just like it reminded me of that other point. So artful, I'll, I'll type it A R T F O L is more artist centric. It's a really small platform. Um, there's not a lot of people using it, not a lot of people talking about it, but, and, and they haven't, they're doing something kind of interesting in that you can purchase premium and that's how they plan on funding the platform. So, you know, I probably will end up purchasing a premium just to help support it. But right now I think, and I think I tweeted this at one point, I think for art centric social networks like ArtStation and Artfall to stand out, what they really need to do is they need to go out of their way to cater to agents, editors, publishers, get them on the site too, so that they can convince, so that they can show artists like, hey, look, this isn't the biggest audience in the world. You're not going to have a million followers, but there's a high likelihood that an editor might see your work. You know, someone who is in a position to pay you. And B said, the way social media has been lately, past few years for artists has made me really take a step back and try, though it's not easy, to reevaluate why I make art and what I want to make. If I, man, if I could fist bump you right now, yes, yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> Uh, last year before the pandemic, we went to see weathering with you. I was, I was about to quit. Like, honestly, that night I was like, I mean, I'd been thinking about it for a while. I was super depressed and I was like, I'm really done. And watching Makoto Shinkai talk about how people had compared him to Ghibli and said he'd never be worth it. And why should they support his movies when they could just see a Ghibli movie? Like I, I felt seen, I felt like I really got it. And then weathering with you was gorgeous. I sobbed the whole time. And that kind of like pumped me up to keep going for a little while. But yeah, it is important it, to have a really strong idea of why you make. My problem is I make to communicate. So if, if it is a one-way conversation, it do, and I don't have to be popular, but it has to be a two-way conversation. Otherwise I've lost my meaning, my reason for making. Um, We band together and make our own platform. We'll see. I mean, we can revisit that conversation, but check out Artfall. Uh, check out Mastodon.art and check out Pillowfort because these are all platforms that are... So Artfall is, I think, trying to do what Instagram has decided they're not going to do. Mastodon is trying to do what Twitter has decided they're not going to do and pillow fort is trying to do what tumblr said they weren't going to or not going to do anymore oh yeah joseph totally wants to make a social media platform that's definitely his his dream all right so now that i i mean we can totally keep talking about that but i'm going to switch focus now to my favorite watercolor supplies because i mean not last week but the week before we talked about Hey Kala's, hey, hey Kala's favorite art supplies when checking out her art supply box. And I thought it would be really cool to like, just chat with you guys about my favorites. And uh, hey Bugsy, yeah, we're talking about <laughs> social media and watercolor. Um, so I actually have an outline that I wrote, hoping that I could um, <laughs> be more, be more together. And uh, I'm going to do my best, y'all. So I'm just going to start bringing things out in batches, talking to you guys about what I like, why I like it. Y'all are definitely totally invited to make your own suggestions because, like, you know, I can't cover everything. And I also really love how different artists like different products. So, you know, you're totally welcome. Please do talk about Oh, what mess did I make? Talk about your own favorites. 
and uh, these are in no no fancy or particular order well it was it is big news the the instagram stuff definitely left shock waves on on twitter not that not that people necessarily didn't see it coming um it's just you know it's not great news i mean it's really 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 bad for for photographers i'm sure there are a lot of wedding photographers who have built up their entire business thanks to instagram helping them out and helping spread word of mouth and now they might be you know sol and i mean not that instagram owes us any anything really you know we're using the platform but when you've been encouraged to build your whole life and put all these hours and put all this time into a platform or multiple platforms and they change things in a way that is just so fundamentally different from what they used to be you feel like you feel like the the world has just been ripped out from under you in a way and um yeah that's that's rough sorry i'm looking for some scratch paper because part of my goal is i want to demonstrate these things for you guys as much as possible so you guys can kind of get the gist of why i like what i like in case in case i haven't like blathered on about it a million years how is it that when i need like scratch watercolor paper i never have it but i am I, I grabbed a bunch of stuff tonight so I'd have it handy. Uh, well, whatever. Okay. Maybe I just don't want to like use nice paper for this. So I'm going to start with uh, my drawing implements. So Queen Messy here. Let me, let me give you guys kind of an overview first. Oh yeah, the camera's not going to pick that up. So usually when I am starting a watercolor illustration, um, I'm either starting it, I mean, this is not 100% and we'll go into that. I'm usually starting it with either pencils or with inks and sometimes with like, uh, I do that lineless technique where I use colored lead for the underdrawing. So that's kind of where I'm starting with this tonight. And uh, generally I like working with stuff that's going to be water safe, even if my, my plan is to ink it after I've painted it. So this is just an inexpensive little, like, it's not even a watercolor sketchbook really. It's like a, a general use sketchbook. This is cellulose paper. It's not super great. It's not super exciting. It's just good to kind of demonstrate. Bugsy says, I know Artfall isn't great for people selling their art, but since I'm just a hobbyist right now, I want to try it out and see how it compares to my small art Twitter. You know, I have to say, I can't necessarily say at this point in time, Instagram or Twitter has been super great either. So, I mean, Artfall isn't the worst. Yeah, that, that that's why I said take a look at Artfall. Oh, so Joseph said I think you could definitely leverage existing open source social media platforms. Is get but the problem is getting people interested, um, and that's why I said take a look at Artfall, Pillow Fort, and Mastodon Art because those are all platforms that are by artists for artists, and their major well Pillow Fort was down for several days when they went public because they got swarmed with. Um, new users and they weren't able to handle that but artfall is having trouble getting enough people on it and uh joseph said most people are already overwhelmed with the number of social networks so you need a clear vision which is communicated easily and i think the way that's going to happen is if instagram actually makes the decides to go TikTok and all the artists are like I can't do this okay so I really like using colored lead this is a uh, dang it very soft tonight it's because it's so humid it's been raining non-stop for like a week and a half and when that happens the colored lead gets like really snappy so what I like about pilot color Eno is that I can do all my sketching and then I can either watercolor or marker on top of it and it will 
basically like as long as I erase all the extraneous lines, the lines that we don't really need, um, it basically looks like I never penciled or, or inked it. It just, I just went straight in. And then I have the option to uh, ink it after if I want to, or just kind of leave it as is. Is the camera, the camera's not gonna pick it up. That's, that's fine. <laughs> um, and I usually go with like pink or red because you know, that's very close to many skin tones. So it really can just disappear. I also like this particular lead because it's very erasable and I can put it in a mechanical pencil and it's available in size seven. So not all the colored leads are available in those larger sizes. And as you guys have seen, I'm very heavy handed. So I'm a lead snapper. Maybe I'll paint that towards the end of the night, but that's one of the reasons I like using this. I also like inking with brush pens. So, I mean, yeah, you can use fix with nibs. Um, I think everybody's pretty familiar with like microns and stuff. Those are waterproof. Those are alcohol marker safe. I like brush tips. Um, again, I'm heavy handed. So I generally prefer something that is either smaller, like the, uh, Sakura, my brain is betraying me. It's like, it's Faber-Castell, it's Faber-Castell. No, it's not. Uh, the Sakura Pigma FB. Um, so they make microns. They also make these. Uh, these are available in three sizes. So uh, for some reason I have two of the FBs and one of the BB and none of the MBs. I also really like uh, the Tombow Fure Nosuke brush pins. So you guys have probably seen me use these a lot with alcohol markers. These work with watercolor as well. They are waterproof, uh, but usually when I'm using these and I'm watercoloring, I like to ink with these after the fact rather than before. In fact, if I do a little bit of digging, I can actually kind of kill two birds with one stone. So uh, I was talking about lineless watercolor illustration. So this is set up for just that. And then I could ink it after. This would be an example where you guys can still see some of the pink and then I watercolored on top of that and then I inked it. And then this or this would be an example where I used the pink lead to do the underdrawing and I painted it and then I went back in and inked only the areas where I felt like it needed some ink. So um, I really like that technique because it results in a much lighter feeling illustration and uh, you can use the ink to tighten up the illustration and it doesn't necessarily add a whole lot of black or a whole lot of darker colors um, unless you want them added in. It's also just good for sketching because it's not like you have to wait for the, if you do the lineless style and then ink after, it's not like you have to wait for the ink to cure. It's not like you have to um, worry about smearing. You can just, and it's not like you're erasing all this extra graphite. You're just getting rid of the little bit of extra pink lead that you might have on the paper. Yes, I do have videos about most of these, if not all of these and I'm also happy to demonstrate stuff as we go along. Hey, Feather, good evening. I am going to list my art supplies later. Yeah, and I also have um, a bit of an outline, so I'll be sure to share that. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, and Nancy and Calvin are saying that it only appears in shadow. Yeah, I have the studio lit up like the sun and the camera that I'm using is not the best camera. So um, if I were gonna be doing a portion where I sketched a lot in the pink light, I'd go ahead and adjust the camera so you guys could see it, but uh, hope hopefully not. Hey, Nisa, good evening. Um, yeah, so I'm a big brush pin person mostly because you can get the really, really fine lines. Oh, it's not gonna show, not gonna show up. That stay. And you can get the really thick lines. And I also find that I 
ink a lot faster with a brush pen than I do if I'm using microns or fix with nibs just because I don't have to like go over the same area a million times trying to get my line weight thicker but you know it's a your mileage may vary situation and the more you use something the faster you're gonna get with it the Tombow Fude Nosuke pins are a little bit harder like a little stiffer than the Sakura Pigma ones but I mean I like that about them they're also available in a bunch of colors including neons um, you can get them in sets. I was buying them open stock so that I was only getting the colors I might actually need. And most of these are running dry because I use these all the time, especially if I'm doing um, like an alcohol marker piece. I love doing the line art. Actually, I have some examples. Let me grab some. Um, but I love doing line art with the colored inks because I think it adds a lot of vibrancy to the illustration. So here is an example for an upcoming tutorial, the Tombow Furinosuke's to go ahead and ink that. So when I'm, when I'm buying brush pins, I am typically look, oh, excuse me. I'm typically looking for stuff that are either sold as pigment based. So like Karen has these new um, pigment brush pins that I'd like to try. I have a, a big box of stuff that I still need to review. So uh, I'm not getting them yet, but I would like to try them. They kind of look like they're opaque, like Posca's are. So I'm very intrigued. But typically I'm looking for like pigment based inks. So when Kuratake released the Cambio Tambians, I was really excited because these are waterproof and marker proof and you get a much larger brush on them. The only downside to these is you can't control the ink flow. So squeezing the body does nothing to help and they will just like dump ink on the paper but they are alcohol marker safe and waterproof. So if you like to work larger, these could be a great fit. And I think these are available in 12 colors. Again, I bought, um, I got, yeah, open stock. So I went, just got the colors that I knew I would actually use. And Pentel has a black pigment pen that I also really like, and I do use it pretty frequently and they've wandered off somewhere. And Nancy said, I just bought a new to me Molotov arc masking liquid pump marker. I haven't tried it yet, but really excited. I remember I used to really like the Molotov. My only problem is, and uh, Cindy mentioned a solution to this, but she's not in the chat tonight. Um, my problem was they use these uh, like fiber tips, if you've got the one I'm thinking of, and the fiber tips die really quick even if you're really careful with them, they get all clogged up. But Cindy was saying that she buys like the empty and then fills it with the liquid sold for the pump marker. And the empties have, I guess, a different nib and they're not, it's like the twin and it's not as likely to clog. I wish she was in here because she could give more feedback. And uh, Tali said before I had the color Eno, what did I use prior for my undersketching? I have been using color Eno for 15 years now, so a minute. Uh, before that, uh, I was using the Pentel red and blue lead. There just wasn't a lot available at that time. There's a lot more available now. Um, but I wasn't doing watercolor or anything like that on top of it. I was just using it as, as underdrawing when I was doing anatomy studies and just graphite because I was just using it for anatomy studies. But if you don't want to order the color Eno, um, I'm looking, Paper Mate makes colored leads for um, mechanical pencils now. And you can get those at like Walmart. You can get them at, I've seen them at Michael's, these. And these work okay. They're different, there's different colors than the color Eno, so they're darker. They might not be as prone to just kind of disappearing, but I mean, it's a similar principle. Oh, Cindy was in chat. I'm sorry. I missed it. Um, yes, masking liquid in a pen is 
I like I love the idea. I've tried the Molotow and I've tried the the Pabio and the Pabio has a plastic nib to it so it's a little bit better but it still ends up clogging on me and dying and then I'm like ah, I love the idea and I hate the execution. Um, so I am sure there are like if you're into fountain pens there's a lot of pigment based fountain pen inks that are going to be waterproof like the Sailor Storia line. Um, the platinum carbon black is pigment based. There's like a, the, the Kuro ones are all pigment based. In fact, uh, Kabocha and I, once upon a time, had a, uh, a tumbler dedicated to our experiments with fountain pennings a few years ago. And I can't, we kind of talk about what's water, like a hundred percent waterproof there. Um, and you could put that into like a brush pen or you could put it into like an empty pocket brush or you know you could use it with a dip brush you know um that has some options there i have a bunch of storia inks but they're all packed up and um then there's also the akashia sai thin line and you want to make sure it's the thin lines because akashia also makes these water watercolor brush pens that are very water soluble these are waterproof and they have the super fine little bristles to them. So you can see it dry brushing. That's because the ink flow just can't keep up with the speed and the line weight and the paper texture. Yes, thank you. My brain was just like hardcore, not wanting to, not wanting to go. And then there's also some iron gall inks that are more or less waterproof, kind of depending on what you're willing to put up with. Oh, Artist Loft watercolor paints. Uh, some people can make some nice things with them, but I find that those are more like, when they dry, they, um, they dry very chalky, and I've noticed that they're very prone to cracking off the paper. So enjoy! enjoy. Maybe if you added some glycerin, you wouldn't have those problems with them. Or maybe that was just like a me problem. Sometimes I feel like I'm the only person who struggles with a certain art supply. Anyway, these are all things I enjoy using to ink, to pencil my watercolor illustrations. Um, speaking of pencil, I mostly use mechanical pencils. They're not great for the hand, which is why I've reviewed so many trying to find ones that don't just like totally eat your hand up. Um, and I use lighter leads at this point because like softer leads, the water will cause them to smear. They're just more noticeable on the paper. So unless I was doing like, like a graphite wash or something like that, where that's okay. Um, I use like an HB lead or an H lead. So that's mostly what I, because, because I do comics and I do illustrations. So I'm very focused on, um, getting marks on the paper and using a material that, you know, generates a mark that I like and is easy to use. Um, you know, different artists are going to have different needs and different expectations in that arena. So it also becomes kind of a, your mileage may vary sort of situation, and, you know, working with what you enjoy. Like some people will use charcoal for their underdrawings. Some people will use an alcohol marker for their underdrawings and then paint on top of that. Cause you can watercolor on top of alcohol marker inks. They are, they're not going to react with one another. So I also wanted to share, I mean, y'all, y'all know what my art looks like, but I still wanted to like take a minute and share some of my stuff with you guys. A lot of these have, were either used as field tests or tutorials, but it also gives me a chance to talk about the watercolors, the materials, the papers that I use for that. So, um, a lot of my field tests these days are printed out. So um, I use like old art of mine and I use a large format printer and I print blue lines and then I repencil it and I re-ink it. Um, I use those for my field tests. So this was trying out Rembrandt watercolors and this was Stonehenge watercolor paper, which is a, not overly, it's a very affordable cotton rag paper, 
Um, it doesn't necessarily have as much sizing as say like arches or like saunders. Um, so it can be a little bit pulpy. It can be a little bit fabric-y. You definitely do want to make sure you secure it and you stretch it. And I'll talk about what I like to use for stretching in a little bit. Um, and it was inked with the Sakura Pigma FB. So you're going to see that a lot. So same paper, the, uh, huh, the <laughs> sorry, brain is just like hardcore shutting down right now. The Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press inked with a Sakura Pigma FB. Um, and this was the PWC watercolor field test. I really, really like the PWC watercolors. Um, where I get them, I buy them open stock and they're like $5 a tube for a full size tube. So that's a great price for professional grade watercolors. And I would say that, so they're made by Shinhan and I would say they're probably comparable to Holbein and they definitely feel about as milled as finely milled as Holbein. So if you like Holbein, and you're in the US and you're looking for something a little cheaper, PWC might be a good fit for you. So with a lot of these, um, I paint them and then I end up re-inking them because I find that some of these watercolors like the Rembrandt are more opaque than I'm really expecting. And that can kind of negatively affect the color gamut, the contrast gamut of the illustration because it creates a muddy haze over the inks. So I'll re-ink it just to kind of help boost that contrast again. And that's just become part of my, my process. I've gotten really used to that. So uh, Stonehenge, Sakura Pigma FB. This was a test for the Supervision watercolors, not the super granulating ones, but just like their regular watercolors. And I really thought I'd like them, but they're, a lot of their colors are grain. So I don't mind gritty. They're more gritty, not necessarily granulating, but like you get big chunks of the paint in your solution. Like their yellow, yellow ochre is a very gritty yellow ochre. So for the kind of illustration I do, as you guys can see, I draw a lot of little faces. I try to avoid anything that's going to like get super granulated on the face if I can help it. Again, Stonehenge. So like for the field test, I'm consistently trying to use the same paper because it does let me focus on the ink. This was the Paul Rubens watercolors and we're gonna talk about that more. I actually ended up really liking the Paul Rubens tube watercolors and they have a set out. It's actually a set I got for Christmas that comes with um, the palette and like 24 of the tubes. And that was a, it was a really good deal for the price. So that's what I would recommend to somebody who doesn't mind putting down a little extra money, but they want to get started on the right foot. Granny yellow ochre means granulation. Okay, not what I'm, no, not no. It was like chunks of the paint, like a millimeter in diameter. So it wasn't dissolving into the solution. Like I'm, I, I, I'm not talking like, I know granulation, like, and, and even then I like predictable granulation when I'm painting characters. Like, like, okay, that's granulation. That's fine. I expect that to an extent, but I don't expect the paint to like leave chunks of the paint. Like it wasn't processed very well in after I've already mixed the color. Like I want it to dissolve more. And then if it falls out of solution, that's a different story. But, um, I, I, I wish I could explain it. Cause it's like, yeah, that does sound like granulation. I, it was not granulation. And then this would be on Saunders watercolor paper. So all the papers I'm showing you guys right now, with the exception of like one, these are all gonna be cotton rag watercolor pa papers with cold, give me a sec, my brain needs to recalibrate. Cotton rag watercolor papers. So not mixed fiber here with the exception of one, and they all have a cold press finish. So if you're not familiar with the difference between cold press and hot press, to be really, really real when you're working with cellulose paper, that's really just the distinction in surface texture. And me personally would not, I would not recommend you get like a cellulose based hot press for watercolor because you might as well just paint on Bristol for that. Um, but it does make more of a difference with cotton rag because cold press is run through cold rollers in the final processing. So you get a lot of that distinct texture still. And then hot press is run through hot rollers. So you get a really, really uh, smooth finish and the fibers are more compressed. So I have found 
cold press it does have more texture but cold press really likes wet into wet a lot more and hot press doesn't really like a lot of wet into wet you can't do a lot of glazes with hot press because everything kind of just stays on the surface and Dawn said I understand what you're talking about yeah okay yes I work with cheap watercolor paints a lot it is definitely more an issue with cheap um, half pan paints usually inexpensive tubes you don't notice it that inexpensive tubes have their own problems but with cheap half pans it does become noticeable like the the prima marketing watercolors so the the mungyo watercolors um they also make the the dane davenport watercolors are just rebranded mungyo watercolors those have that problem a lot too it's not it's not fun i don't i don't enjoy it this would be another example of Saunders. So um, Saunders has a lot of both internal and external sizing and sizing is, there are some vegetable based sizings, but it's typically like a gelatin sort of thing. And um, it's used to give the paper itself a lot of structure. And uh, so Stonehenge watercolor paper, you know how I said it gets kind of pulpy, it gets kind of fabricy and floppy. It doesn't have a lot of internal sizing. Saunders is a lot like painting on board or cardboard and it has a lot of sizing um, and years ago I got in a Twitter fight with someone I knew from undergrad who said that stretching watercolor paper removes all the sizing it doesn't um, because if that was the case then every time you do a really wet watercolor wash it would remove all the sizing if you're using hot water it will remove the sizing because it's gelatin it'll dissolve but if you're using cold water it's not going anywhere really um, but you really shouldn't be using hot water with your watercolor anyway because it'll dis dissolve the glue in your brushes like the glue that holds the bristles and the ferrule so you really shouldn't be using hot water with your watercolors anyway um even though i always stretch my watercolors and i'll talk about that in a little bit i live in a really humid climate i think many of y'all can uh, you know you deal with that too and even though my watercolors will be nice and tight and flat when i remove them from the board if they just sit out and since we're in between houses right now they are just sitting out they i do notice my watercolors have a tendency to buckle a little bit i'm not really concerned about that because i do know that if i store it flat with some weights on top of it it'll flatten itself out but you know i want to point it out it's not my favorite if i was pointing on oh i ought to talk about paper weights a little bit while we're doing all this so all of the papers you guys are seeing are all 140 pound watercolor papers. Some of them are thicker than others. Um, 140 pound watercolor paper is a little bit heavier than cardstock. And um, it has to do with like, oh my goodness, the weight of like a ream. I'd have to look it up. It's, it's a specific weight. It doesn't mean that each page weighs 140 pounds but it has to do with like a certain amount of that paper weighing a certain amount so 300 pound watercolor paper is much much thicker that's more like illustration board 300 pound watercolor paper you don't necessarily have to stretch it because it's very heavy watercolor paper 300 pound watercolor paper is not going to bend like this and on that note this is cheap joe's kilimanjaro watercolor paper which i do really like but it's a bit more like it, it takes colors beautifully but in terms of like weight and bendiness it, it's a little bit more like a student grade paper and Dawn said, I love using hot press watercolor paper for color pencils. It works great. Yeah, I bet it would. I, you get that like um, kind of buttery smoothness with it. And Calvin said, all my painting develops some kind of bend due to humid air, even though I'm using 300. Ooh, even though you're, well, 300 is 140 pounds. So that's, that's what I'm noticing as well. And it's just the humidity, the paper reabsorbing it. Um, so this would be another example of Stonehenge watercolor paper. Um, for this though, I just used my daily driver palette, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's just bits and bobs of my favorite brands and favorite colors all in one palette for my own convenience. And I'll also talk about having a convenience color palette in a little bit as well, because I know that's probably going to come up. I believe this is on arches. So when I'm buying watercolor paper, 
I'm either buying it in a block and I will, I'll grab a block in a minute. Blocks are pre-stretched, but sometimes I'll cut them and, you know, use them as a single sheet or I'll buy them as a pad where they're only bound on one side. I don't really like buying the big loose sheets um, in a way that could be more economical because you can tear it down to size. But like, let's be real. Do y'all ever tear them down to size? I don't ever do them down to size. I have tried that in the past, especially with some of the Strathmore papers that aren't available in pads and aren't available in blocks or sketchbooks. And I never really get around to it. And if you guys have any questions, like, please, please tell me. I'm just kind of rolling through stuff. When storing my illustrations, what do you use? Usually I will use archival boxes from Dick Blick because they are acid free and they're meant to help preserve your art for like a hundred years. Um, and all of those are at my mom's house right now. So all of my comic pages are at my mom's house because I would have liked to have shown you guys my comic pages, but I don't have them. Um, I will also use Itolia. Let me spell it because my pronunciation is horrible. Itolia portfolios. Um, and I go with the I tell you the cheaper I tell you ones because they're still um, going to be archival. They're still going to protect your paper. They're a book format. So they have individual plastic sheets with uh, acid free paper in between and you can store your work in that and then shut it and that'll help keep it flat. And I like that, especially for art that I sell or to take to shows because it's also easy to it keeps it safe and it's also easy to display. Um, you can also buy uh, archival bags, crystal clear, make some decent archival bags that aren't too expensive. And I use the crystal clear bags when I'm selling like watercolor commissions or alcohol marker commissions. They're also, um, so all of three of the things that I've mentioned also have some UV protection properties as well. Um, Dawn said they fell in love with buying paper and rolls. It's more, it is more of a bargain. It is way more economical. Blocks and pads can work, uh, can work out to be more expensive. That is definitely true. Uh, my thing about the sheets and the rolls is they will probably get damaged. You know, I have a cat, I'm kind of a mess. I don't have a lot of space to like lay it out and tear it. So it's really about finding what works best for you. And yeah, archival boxes are a thing. Uh, Dick Blick has them. Let me grab them. They have all kinds too. I buy their brand because they're a little bit cheaper, but there's a lot of different archival storage solutions. So photo boxes, um, that's another thing though. Uh, so a lot of um, photo albums are designed to be acid free. They're designed to protect those photos. They're designed to be archival. So if you work smaller, you could probably use a photo album with acid free inserts and that would probably work for you. So, I mean, honestly, you could even use like a three ring binder. And as long as you're using acid free page protectors, it will do more than just storing it out in the air. Uh, Calvin says, I just store mine in a plastic holder from a stationary shop. Sure. That, I mean, sorry. <laughs> I mean, that works. Um, it's not going to be archival, but so that kind of, that kind of falls into like a, um, it might be archival. I mean, if it says it's archival, then it's archival. Um, that kind of falls into a weird category for me because if you're doing it for you and you don't ever intend on selling it, then do what you like. You know, don't, you don't have to spend a lot of money to preserve something if you are just doing it because you enjoy doing it. I'm not trying to like talk y'all into spending a lot of money. Um, in fact, when I'm doing shows and I'm selling originals, I have them in the I tell you portfolios, but I've had the same three portfolios for like 10 years now. So, um, you know, I'm not going out and buying the newest and the most expensive. I'm trying to use them as long as I can until they fall apart. Um, I know Michaels does have some archival boxes and I'm not saying the plastic boxes 
aren't going to protect them. I don't know enough about that. And if you maybe threw in some of those desiccator packets that you get with like clothes and stuff, that might be like, that might be fine. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> no. I could definitely research it and write a blog post about it, but I would not necessarily feel confident doing a video. You get what I'm saying? Because I spent a lot of, when I'm writing blog posts or when I used to write blog posts, um, it feels like less pressure because I can rewrite and rewrite and add links and rewrite a paragraph. Whereas if I'm doing a video, I feel like I have to get it out real quick. Um, and then I'll, I'll move these for a second. This is on Canton Moulin de Roy. Uh, I really like Moulin de Roy. Uh, it can be a little harder to find. I can find it from Jackson's. And Maddie, who's not with us this evening, told me that it's meant to be double-sided. So I haven't ever tried painting on the back, but it seems like the back is more of like a hot prep, closer to a hot press finish than the front. So I would definitely be interested in experimenting with that some in the future because I have some misprints from my printer. And usually what I do is I just cut everything out except the area that's misprinted. But if I can paint on the back, then I can just use the whole thing on the back and just ignore what was on the front. Yeah, I will be able to report back soon regarding the desiccator packets. I just don't know yet. See, I was thinking building a box that had um, computer fans in it because a lot of getting watercolor to dry is air circulation. Um, but the desiccator packs are actually going to probably be useful for long-term st storage if they are not acidic, if they don't add acid to the environment. And then finally, out of this little selection that I have, it wasn't much, I just picked some favorites that I wanted to show you guys. Um, I have some watercolor examples on my Trina, my Mayor Teeny. I'm sorry, the script it's written with is like really hard for me to read for some reason. These, the fishies. Um, and these are a mixed fiber paper. And usually I hate mixed fiber papers. Like Fabriano makes a mixed fiber paper. I hate it for watercolor, but I like it for inking. Um, I, I, I generally have the stance that mixed fiber papers have the, the worst of both paper types. Um, they just have the, pro the worst problems from both. And this one isn't really much of an exception, but it's so small and so cute. And there's just something very satisfying about small, cute watercolors that I'm gonna use it anyway. Um, so these were penciled. And then I inked them with the Sakura Pigma and then I erased the pencils and then I painted them with different various watercolors. So these were, this one was my core pocket set, which I also really like. Also, please do not take me talking about a bunch of different things as me saying, go out and buy a bunch of different things. I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> I just have a problem with accruing art supplies, but I do try to use them. So, um, I'm not, I'm not over here. Like you have to have these things. You, you definitely don't have to have these things. And we can talk about the things I really recommend. And I think you'll enjoy the most, but I kind of just wanted to like share my favorites with you guys. And then if you guys want to see, um, I do put watercolor paper under a ceiling fan, sir. I do that. I know the tin, I, the tin's cute too. They got me. They, it's easy to get me. They got me. Um, so what I like about core watercolors is that their colors are really clean and vibrant. You do get some granulation, but because they're not using gum Arabic, my, my gum Arabic is not even representative of what gum Arabic looks like because it has gotten so nasty and brown, but it is normally kind of a yellow color. Um, they use Aquazole, which my Aquazole is kind of turning yellow and it's usually clearer. Um, anyway, so you end up with cleaner colors, like cleaner purples, cleaner blues. Um, I have had this palette a while and I use like several years and I use this palette all the time and, um, I do need to refill it. I'm just going to refill it from the tubes and, uh, they last a really long time. So I felt like this, I feel like this palette is a good investment for someone who would like to use professional watercolors, doesn't have a lot of space, doesn't want to buy a bunch of colors, and they want something that's going to be decent off the bat. They want something that they're going to like off the bat. And I'll talk about 
uh, student grade versus professional grade in a little bit. I've been reviewing some better student grade watercolors. So if you really don't, this is like around $50. So if you're not, if you don't want to spend all that, I can recommend some decent student grades. Um, but you know, the thing is student grade paper, student grade paints, they don't really handle the way professional paints do. It's literally like using tempera, little kid tempera watercolors and saying, okay, I've used watercolor. It's, they're not bad. They're not unusable, but they're very different. And it honestly helps to have experience with the nicer stuff because you kind of learn some tricks that you can then use with the cheaper stuff. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, this one was done with the Daniel Smith, um, ultimate mixing palette, which I have, and I don't know where it ran off to, but I, I don't really like, I don't really like swear by it. That palette's not so great for me. I think Calvin would like it because it has a lot of granulation. It has a very assertive personality. Um, and there's some opacity to the colors. So I think it's a good palette for landscape artists or people who are not going to do 3 million layers, but for somebody like me, who's going to do a bajillion layers, it's not the best fit, but it is still a quality watercolor palette. It's just not the best fit for the kind of art I, I like to paint. This was done with like a variety of paints, but a lot of the, this is, this is kind of a specialty custom palette for me. A lot of the more opaque colors that Holbein makes and that PWC makes. So kind of over here and over here. And I kind of treat these as, um, a specialty palette because for me, the, these more unusual, like neon kind of colors and more opaque kind of colors, you can't mix them the same way you would necessarily mix your average watercolor. So by keeping them in their own palette, I'm not going to make the mistake of, of using them and making mud and wondering why I have mud. And then this one was painted with the Da Vinci palette that you guys saw me refilling way back when we were talking about um, Instagram. So this palette has gotten a lot of use. Uh, what I like about this palette, first off, these are made in America, so is Core. Uh, they, with their mixing palette, you get whole pans. So if you like to paint big, you can actually get your brush in here, which with the Core palette, those pans are so small. Um, you can refill it just from the tube, same with, with Core. I do find that buying tube watercolors and then refilling my half pans or pans is more economical than buying, you know, half pans or pans for years. I used to go out of my way to buy um, Windsor and Newton half pans because one of their reps had me convinced that they were super specially formulated to reactivate and no other watercolor, blah, blah, blah. He basically, uh, oversold half, they're, they're fine, but you can refill your half pans with, with tube watercolors in most instances. Mayan blue is like the glaring example and no, you can't because it turns to clay. Um, but in general, you can refill your pans and half pans from the tube. And it's actually gonna, I find it's more economical for me than, you know, buying half pan, half pan, half pan, half pan, half pan. And I'm, I'm allowing these to attempt to dry out. So I'm gonna be leaving that open off camera. So we can start talking about paints now that I've kind of given a bit of an overview. Um, ba -ba. Give me, give me a sec. Sorry there. Uh, it's a shame that sharpener is cute. Which sharpener? Um, pretty palette choices. There's a lot of dimension in that piece. Thank you. That's something I really do try. Oh, I missed one. Let me show you that before. That's something I, I do try to push in my art. Um, as I'm trying to figure out how to make myself stand out as an artist and how to make my work viable and how to sell it. <laughs> as I try to figure out the commercial elements of finding an agent and marketing my work, that's something that I'm really working on is creating dimension and creating a sense of atmosphere and creating a sense of character and personality and creating environments. So, that's something that when I'm painting, I'm really thinking about those things a lot. And I, I find lately I've been talking about them a lot in my tutorials, not so much about this is how you paint, but like my thought process 
behind what I'm doing. And I hope that's helpful to people because I think it's helpful too. And Calvin said, too many watercolor sets come with half pans. Not really sure why it's so popular. It's a cheap way to get a lot of colors in a small set. And we'll talk about that in a second. So talking about, about paints. Oh, I got up to show you something. What was it? Okay. And this is, this is not by any shakes all inclusive. I'm just grabbing a few things so we can kind of talk about that. Make sure I'm on, it's on camera. And, and I'm also, I mean, I know you guys know this, but I just want to reiterate, point this out again. These are just my opinions. Um, I paint watercolor comics, so a lot of my opinions are formed by the work that I make and uh, the choices that I'm making when I make that work. It's not a universal. I am not promising the ultimate watercolor panacea. And I kind of resent people when they do say that because uh, they tend to have a very myopic view of what watercolor can be. And one of the things I love about watercolor is it can be all kinds of different things. So these are my opinions. Your mileage may vary, yada, yada, yada. Hey, Hema, good evening. So I'm going to talk a bit about paint and palettes. And please ask me questions. If you want to see something demonstrated, let me know. I mean, that's, that's the point. <laughs> Otherwise, I feel like I'm showing off and I don't like that. Um, okay, so we'll start with my Daily Driver palette. This thing is so ratty and beaten up and it is about as old as Kira is. So I've been using this thing for about 10 years and it doesn't shut. I have to tape it and it has gone with me to so many, so many conventions. It has flown with me so many times. It's gone with me to several countries. So it looks the way it looks. Um, I'm actually, I want to, I have a couple of empty Derwent tins and what I want to do is I want to have a magnetic palette and just convert this to a large magnetic palette. And then I can have even more convenience colors in one place, but that's what it's, it's full of. And it looks really gross, okay? Um, because I use it all the time, it's nasty. So it, it also has some cat hair in it because I have a cat, though not as much as it used to because I don't paint on the floor anymore. So one of the things I want you guys to kind of notice is, so this is my color map. Many of these colors look bright, look vivid, but then when you look at them in mass tone, so the pile of paint, they're not that bright. And that's because most of these paints are not including optical brighteners to make the paints look more enticing, to make the paints look more vivid and to stretch out the paint. So it is very, this palette is well loved. This is the Mei Liang watercolors. And this is actually like the student grade version of the Paul Rubens watercolor. So this is their less expensive line and they're still good. I still like them. I do recommend them. As you guys can see, lots of bright, vivid colors. In fact, everything's kind of the same amount of intensity. And when you look at it, there's more bright, vivid colors in mass tone, right? So, they achieve this by adding optical brighteners. So like PW6, which is a pigment white, like uh, what's used in like titanium white, they will add that to these to stretch it out to make the paints cheaper because it's a really cheap pigment and to make the paints look super bright, super inviting in the palette. And that's one of the reasons I don't really love student grade watercolors is learning how to paint around those optical brighteners is a bit of a challenge. It does take some experience. You can't really mix colors the way you would because they'll turn to mud, um, which is one of the reasons why they give you like a million colors. So you're not mixing so many of them. And uh, honestly, if you handle them kind of like you might Gensai watercolor, they handle a lot better like that. Don't try to do too much color mixing with these kind of student grades. Now, I used to hate student grade watercolor and would really like get on a tirade about them because I had tried uh, Cotman, I really don't like Cotman, and I tried Sennelier's uh, La Petite Acrel, which is not good compared to regular Sennelier. And my big complaint is that in the US, 
cotton, uh, sorry, student grade watercolors cost almost as much as their professional grade counterparts. So just to me at the time, it was just spend some extra money and you'll get way better paints. But then we started getting this influx of Chinese student grade watercolors that are actually pretty good. Like I've already field tested the Mei Liang and I like them. Um, I would recommend them as a great beginner palette, very affordable. You get a lot of colors. It's about $20. And once you're done with these, buy their big brother, Paul Rubin, also very cheap. And then these are the Mia watercolors. Um, the review hasn't gone live to the public yet. And I, I think these are student grade watercolors. To me, these are student grade watercolors. The price point also says student grade, they're about 20 bucks. Um, and you guys can see a lot of really bright, vivid colors, lots of optical brighteners. Um, give me a sec. Dawn said, kind of look like the Kurosaki Gensai Tabi watercolors. Some paints have white pigment. Some paints do have white pigment. Um, that's a lot of the pastel paints. I'm iffy about that to begin with. That's why I have my pastel colors in their own palette. Um, so yes, yeah, some paints do have that. That is a nature of some mixes. Uh, but with student grade, it tends to be in colors you wouldn't necessarily want that to be in. So it will often be in yellows, oranges, reds, some of the blues, which means you get a lot of muddy mixes. Uh, Calvin said, I think it's a nature of transparent paint. They always look darker in mass tone, but opaque paint like yellow ochre will appear the same in your swatches. Not all yellow ochres are equally opaque. Um, some of them are semi-transparent. I, I typically lean myself more towards the semi-transparent ones because I use them for mixing faces. And also, and uh, this is a sneak peek kind of to an upcoming video. And I've talked about this before and I have a, a blog post on it that I've never really released because I never finished writing it. It totally depends on the country where it's formulated. So these are Chinese Windsor Newton paints. And there was a kerfuffle on the internet because people thought these were a knockoff. These are not a knockoff. These are made for the Chinese market using Chinese granulate. These are Chinese pigments. Um, and these are more like traditional Chinese watercolors. So if you're using traditional Chinese watercolors, traditional Korean watercolors, traditional Japanese watercolors, they are not necessarily as milled, as finely milled as some other brands of paint, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. They're just a little bit different. They have a different use case. So they are often a little bit more opaque than their Western counterparts. And I can't wait to do a head-to-head -head comparison with these. That's the plan is to do a head-to-head -head comparison against Western Windsor and Newton watercolors and see how they differ. Um, so it kind of depends on what country of origin, where your paints are coming from, as to how they are formulated. And then it kind of boils down to what do you like and what do you like to paint? Um, Kima said, I have the praying watercolors from high school. I feel like they kind of have that brightener thing going on from looking at them, do they? They do, not as bad as some. Um, so praying and Yarka children's watercolors are some of the better children's watercolors that I reviewed. And you can actually use them more like you know, regular traditional watercolors. I know people who can use the Crayola washable watercolors and paint beautiful things. I have no idea how they do it because whenever I try, it looks horrible. So I wish I knew their, their magic. Uh, Liz said, Becca, since you have your palettes out, what are your favorite colors? Most used colors, favorite mixes, and do I have a brand preference? Okay, Ooh, okay. Let me, let me copy and paste that so I don't lose it because I want to, I'm going to answer it. Thank you. That is like, that's a fun, these are all fun questions, but that's a fun question. The ADHD brand, brain is a wonderful thing. And then I'll talk more about student paints. Okay. So my favorite colors for the most part end up in this ratty looking palette. It is several different brands all glommed together. For a while, when I was a younger artist, I thought Windsor and Newton was the best because I had limited access to other things. Um, I'd had some bad experiences with Grumbacher and Grumbacher Academy. And at the time, I thought paying $10 for a tube of watercolor paint was a lot, and it is a lot of money. I'm not, 
I am not denigrating that that's expensive, but I, in turn, watercolor lasts a lot longer. A tube of watercolor lasts a lot longer than a tube of acrylic. So, you know, it kind of depends on what your, your, your price point is. So, uh, when I was much younger, I thought Windsor and Newton was like the best because that's, I had limited access and that's what I had access to. And it's okay. There are some colors that are okay, but it also kind of depends on, so you asked what my favorites are, so I, I should focus on that. Um, I really like Magello, but I can't find it open stock anymore. I like Holbein. I like PWC a lot. I love Sennelier. I like M. Grams. I like Daniel Smith but maybe not as much as some people like Daniel Smith, but I really like certain colors. So for every brand that I have in here, I like them for certain colors. So um, like Ultramarine, I really like Sennelier's Ultramarine. It is a really, really clean, pretty blue and Sennelier uses honey as the binder. So it's quick to activate. I don't have to scrub at it. I used to hate ultramarine because some cheaper ultramarines like Windsor Newton's ultramarine has a lot of gunky gum Arabic in it and it looks dirty. Like it's a dirty dark blue color. Whereas Sennelier's is a really pretty color. On the other hand though, Windsor and Newton makes green gold that I absolutely love. And I love their Van Dyke Brown as well. And then I really like um, Holbein if I can get it or Daniel Smith if I can't, they're hookers greens. And then uh, Sennelier makes a Chinese orange that's just really nice and I use it a lot. It's kind of an earthy orange color. Uh, Holbein, make, they call it cherry red, but it's quinacridone red and it's kind of a really pinkish bluish red. I really like their red and then um, Windsor and Newton makes um, an alizarin crimson <laughs> that I use so much. I have two pans for it and it's a really nice alizarin crimson. Daniel Smith makes this dark maroonish color, naphthamide maroon that I use all the time when I'm mixing skin tone shadow kind of colors. Holbein makes this, uh, I think it's permanent mauve that I also really like for skin tones. So I have a bunch of yellow ochre-ish colors here. Um, this one is a Windsor Newton one. I cannot remember which, what its exact name is. It's not just yellow ochre. Um, but so I have one that's more of a gold yellow ochre and then one that's more of like a yellow, yellow ochre. And then Daniel Smith used to make this beautiful Quinn gold. I call it Toyota gold cause they were getting it from Toyota, but they had this beautiful Quinn gold that was just so useful for painting all kinds of natural things like grass and straw and hay, or if you did want to paint gold, it was a beautiful gold. And then um, this is Windsor and Newton neutral tint, but I prefer Holbein's neutral tint. It's more of a warm kind of night sky color. Uh, this is Windsor and Newton's indigo and their indigo is a much cooler indigo. It's not really like a denim color. So I really love it as like a color I use when I'm painting foliage to help build up depth. And then, um, see, I could, I could go on like this forever. Uh, Daniel Smith's undersea green is a really great color. I like using it um, as is to paint foliage or letting it sediment out and super granulate. And you can get those kind of color shifting colors. And we'll talk about super granulating colors in a minute. So I like a lot, it's hard for me to decide. And part of the problem kind of stems from the fact that I've reviewed so many brands that I kind of have favorite colors from each of them. So rather than just like going out and buying a set of 12 and just refilling my pans, <laughs> I'm buying individual tubes. So, um, uh, my, my favorite colors are probably going to end up being my most used colors. Um, and you can't go by what's empty in here because some of them haven't been refilled. Some of them I don't refill cause I don't use them that often. Um, I really, really used to love Indian yellow. I don't use it as much anymore. Um, I do really like ultramarine blue. I use it really frequently for painting the shadows on whites. I really like green gold. 
I really like, I mean, I use alizarin crimson and scarlet red and yellow ochre all the time. Even if I'm not like, oh, I love those colors. I use them a lot. Um, I also use Van Dyke brown and sepia a lot, even though I'm not like, oh, I love those colors. Um, I really like undersea green. It's a beautiful color. I really like these kind of cooler phthalo blues because I paint a lot of foliage. Um, gee whiz. Um, I think, I guess that covers it. I find that I love how a good Quinn magenta looks when mixed with ultramarine blue and the way it granulates out is really beautiful. Uh, oof, there, there's more colors I love than colors I don't love. So, so it's, I'm like, oh, a good question that I am struggling to answer. I've also really come to like cool semi-opaque yellows. They make the most beautiful greens and then they also allow you to kind of paint on top so you can add those, those pops of color back in. And uh, my favorite mixes are, well, so if I'm mixing skin tones, I'm either painting Kara or Naomi a lot. So for Kara, it's yellow ochre and scarlet red. For Naomi, I like to do some under undertones to help develop the skin tone. So I'll use dioxine purple with naphthamide maroon to create like the shadow colors like under the chin and stuff. And then for her base skin tone, I use a little bit of alizarin crimson. So we have some warmth in there. I use some Venetian red. Um, this is, gee, I think that is M. Graham's burnt umber which is like a good just like a good solid brown like a brownie brown like if you were picking a brown crayon it is that and i appreciate that sometimes it's it's useful for it's sometimes it feels like a dead color depending on what you're painting but it's good as a mix in skin tones so uh, i'll use burnt umber and some van dyke brown and then as i'm developing the shadows on her skin i'll start adding in some sepia so those are some of my favorite mixes and then i said um magenta and ultramarine blue is a really beautiful mix um a semi-opaque cool yellow it's probably bismuth yellow or aeolian yellow with a phthalo blue makes for really really nice fresh spring green um I think right now those are like my favorite mixes. Those are the mixes that I get like excited about. And yeah, okay, all right, I covered them all. Woo! Thank you for asking that. That was a fun question. Um, ooh, Hima said, I really have those a decade later. Hima, I gotta send you, after I finish probably the, the Mia field test, I'll probably send those for you. And do I have a, oh, and, and Liz asked, do I have a brand preference? Oh, oh, if I had to pick one. Oh, maybe Da Vinci or Core. Um, because I find that if I just want to bring like a smaller limited selection palette with me, those are the ones I grab. Oh, I'm going to touch on this before I get totally torn to shreds in the chat. I have a lot of convenience colors. So convenience colors are colors that you could technically mix, um, but they're pre-mixed for you. And uh, that's for a few reasons. One, like if you were to mix burnt umber and ultramarine blue, technically you'll make a Payne's gray, but it sediments out very differently and very quickly from a pre-mixed Payne's gray. So I will use both in a painting because they give different feelings, different results. Um, and I use pa regular Payne's Gray, this one, premix Payne's Gray a lot for painting metal because Windsor Newton Payne's Gray is a very cool desaturated sort of gray and it's great for painting silver, it's great for painting metal. Um, when you're painting comics or you're painting a lot of illustrations, you don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time mixing up color, mixing up color, mixing up color, trying to get what you're looking for. So it's nice sometimes to have a color pre-mixed that's close enough to what you're looking for that it makes painting in that amount feasible. So I love convenience colors. Like I'm not gonna sit here and dump on, some people do, some people get kind of um, elitist about it. And they're like, well, you should be able to mix whatever you want from six base colors. And you kind of can. It's hard to get true blacks though. Um, I've done that with the Daniel Smith Essential 6 set and 
while I can get a really nice range of colors, you're not going to mix a dioxine purple. You're just not. With the colors they included, you're not even going to mix a good purple. So convenience colors are there if you need them, what I recommend is you start, if you want to start with professional grade, you start with a small set. And as you're finding like, oh man, I really would like a pink or I really need kind of a brownish red. That's when I would go in and buy additional colors. And I use half pans mainly because if I were using whole pans for everything, this palette would be huge. So, um, this one is a whole pan and uh, I used to use this all the time for, for creating like sky, like uh, day sky mixes. So that's why it was a whole pan. But for me, I go with half pans because of a, it's a size thing. I am glad Dawn said that she loves the Crayola 1953 watercolor paints she bought. They're really good. I'm going to try to seek out some of the older Crayola paints and see, I know they were, I, this is not just nostalgia. I really think they were a little bit better when I was a kid. And I think they were probably way better before they started adding in all the glycerin before they were like, um, they were like <laughs> super washable. And yeah, um, so I do have, this is out for early access that can be viewed as well as this, the Shapira Farben watercolors is up as an early access review. Hey, Kelly, good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, Calvin says bigger particle means more likely to granulate. That's true because it's more likely to fall out of solution quickly. And Bugsy said, I'm very interested to see how they differ too. Were they cheaper than Windsor & Newton here in the U.S. are? I feel like they were, yeah. I mean, I got them on AliExpress. So sometimes the real deal stuff is a little more expensive. Like Supervision stuff can is as expensive as U.S. stuff. Um, and sometimes it's cheaper. I'd have to dig up the receipt, but I do feel like it was cheaper than the same tubes in the U.S. And Feather said that they're really enjoying Holbein's. They have the 12 colors, but they make wonderful mixes. Yes, so one of the things about Holbein is that they're very, very finely milled and they're high quality watercolors, so they make for great mixes. Uh, Calvin said Mission Gold is similar to Holbein, except they use honey and sometimes they add Floaid to their paint, so it flows better than Holbein. I really do like Mission Gold. I think I mentioned them earlier, but they can be harder to find open stock. Like I haven't ever since Jerry's Artorama stopped carrying Mission Gold open stock in the store in like 2014, I haven't seen, I haven't seen them open stock anywhere. And that's Plaza, Dick Blick, David's Art Supply, Michael's. So um, that, so for me, the ability to buy tubes of something I like open stock so that as I use up favorite colors, I can replenish them is really important. But they also have the single pigment paints that I've wanted to try for a while and I couldn't justify it. And Dawn said 12 is good enough once you have a good mixing set. Yeah, that could, I'm, yeah. Obviously, I, I, I don't necessarily 100% agree with that. I think it depends on your use case. But um, if you don't mind doing a little color mixing, yeah. Uh, Liz said, awesome. Thanks for sharing your favorite colors. You're very welcome. Uh, yes, Hima said, the biggest pain is when I was painting, finding I did not mix enough of a color in the middle of the painting. Oh, I feel the pain. Uh, a lot of people say convenience color isn't great, but they also use earth tone, which is a convenience color as they come. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, a lot of the people who um, don't like convenience colors, I saw that a lot on wet paint, have a very, very specific view of what watercolor is and comics and illustration are generally not in their worldview. So I don't, I, you know what I mean? I take that as a, I do what I want. Come and, come and tell me otherwise. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Some, uh, Hema asked why it would be wrong to have a color pre-mix that you use a lot. Um, you know, sometimes people can be elitist about really dumb stuff, really dumb gatekeeping. And Nancy said, did I learn about buying the non-washable Crayola watercolors 
available as an Amazon add-on from you? Maybe? I did try them and they were okay. But I, I, man, you are a careful watcher if you learned about that from me because I feel like I mentioned it once. Oh, and, and Tanner, you and Allie have a good evening. It was good seeing you guys. So I wanna refill my water bottle. Um, I wanna use the bathroom. And I do wanna talk a little bit more about, um, I'm trying to decide if I also wanna grab my tube paints or if I just wanna leave what I've got on the desk up. So usually I buy paints in the tube like you guys saw with the Da Vinci paints and I just refill them like that. It's much more economical for me. I have also found that with student grade watercolors, the tube paints are often a little bit better than their half pan counterparts and you can dry them in the half pans. Years ago, uh, after I found out that Reeves, that brand that Michaels used to sell that a lot of people jokingly call the bane of their watercolor existence, Reeves is made by Windsor and Newton, same as Colart. So I did a big three-way comparison and I found that the Reeves tube watercolors handle better if you dry them in half pans and then use them rather than if you use them straight from the tube. So sometimes you can trick cheap watercolors into being a little bit better. Oh, have a good evening, Feather. It's good to see you. So this is another kind of sneak peek review. This is the Shapira Fabin watercolors. And these are definitely full of optical brighteners. So one of the ways you can tell, not just by looking at the mass tones, I mean, look how, look how bright these colors are. Um, and, and in a way, this could be good if you don't wanna do color mixing, you have a lot of the colors there, you can just grab and paint. So this could be very feasible for doing open air sketching where you don't necessarily wanna mix a bunch of colors or doing like at convention watercolor illustrations or just something that's very off the cuff and informal, it could be great. Um, but as I was swatching these, they turn, so you'll always dirty your water as you're mixing your paints, but with cheaper paints that have a lot of extenders, a lot of optical brighteners, as you're mixing, you'll notice that your brush, even if you just very delicately dip it in the paint, it picks up a lot, a lot of the paint and um, it muddies the water quickly. So what ends up happening is you're using up a lot of your paint just cleaning your brush. So that's one of the reasons I point out that student grade, I think student grade has its place. I'm not saying never student grade, but I think it is not as economical as people sometimes feel like it is because you're going through the paints about twice as fast, sometimes even faster than if you were using their professional grade uh, counterparts. So um, these were not, they were okay, spoiling my own review, they were okay. I haven't done a field test with these yet, so I don't have like a definitive hard and fast opinion, but I did like the Mei Liang paints better. And even though I haven't done a field test yet with the Mia paints, so far I like the Mia paints better than the Mei Liang paints and both of these better than the Shapira Farben. And the Shapira Farben are like 40 bucks. So anything involving liquid is terrifying for me to bring on the go anywhere. <laughs> I can't be rushed. Once I've got my paints out, I'm like, no, I'm here. I am stuck. You're just going to have to leave me because I'm still working. So that's one of the reasons I'm not a big plein air painter is because I'm a little bit slower um, in terms of painting and sketching than some other artists are. So having other people kind of rush me isn't very fun. All right, I'm going to remove our student grade paints from the lineup for the time being. I'm gonna take a quick break and then I wanna talk to you guys about palettes. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, kind of pre-prep some.
I hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm having a lot of fun, and I hope you guys have had a good week so far. It's been so rainy here. I would have liked to have paint. I would have liked to paint, but it's so rainy. I can't really do that. Too too much. All right, I return. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Mm, congrats on your driving instruction permit. Way to go. And also, please keep in mind that this, this has taken many, many, many years to of, of gradual hoarding to amass. And I also, if I don't like an art supply, I do try to rehome it afterwards. So um, giving it to a friend, donating it to the library, donating it to Goodwill, putting it in a little library, you know. Um, I try not to just throw stuff away. I try to find somebody who will enjoy it and benefit from it. So, so I guess that justifies my hoarding. Uh, Dawn said, I tried buying smaller palette. I really like Blick Artist Watercolor. I have, I'm on back order for their, uh, like, test set. And I also have the Utrecht test set. Um, because, yeah, I used to buy the Blick Watercolors and like them. But I don't live near a Blick anymore. So I kind of forgot that I could do that. So I'm waiting. I'm hoping they'll come in. I'm waiting on them. Okay. So, um in terms of palette but before we we go too far into that i have not had a chance to play with aquarius too much i've done um, an unbox and swatch and i've ordered a bunch of additional colors and swatched those this is a brand that is sold on jackson's it's a polish watercolor brand and these are whole pans so a whole pan is like this you could get about an inch brush in there and then over here are some empty half pans just for just for context so a whole pan 
of their watercolor is usually around five to six dollars which isn't a bad deal and so far i would definitely say that these are professional grade watercolors um, and they have the test set which is these colors here so it is lemon yellow um, aquarius red ultramarine light aquarius green which is basically under sea green and cap mortem it's like 25 dollars for this which isn't bad at all um, and then, like I said, their other full pans are, they can range from about $4 to about $7. So not bad if you're looking for um, an affordable entry point into professional grade watercolor. I'm not going to recommend them just yet because I haven't messed with them enough for me to be like, oh yeah, spend your money on this. So, you know, once you've got watercolors, you need somewhere to store them and, you know, you can buy metal palettes like this. This is a Meaden palette. You can get them really cheap on Amazon. You can get them off of AliExpress if you want to. You can get the ones that come with half pans in it. You can get the ones that don't come with half pans. You can order packs of 100 half pans online. Uh, buying the 100 packs is like $14. It's typically cheaper than buying the individual half pans. Um, you can even get the clear half pans, which I think are super cute. So you do have options. I wouldn't, you can 3D print half pans, but I wouldn't recommend that. That's very expensive. So uh, this palette was $50 years ago with no paint, nothing in it. All right. Now you can get a palette like this or like this for 10 to maybe $15 online. So don't, you don't have to get like the whiskey painters or the, the expensive name brand ones because I mean, unless you genuinely think it's a better palette in the end, you, know, you can also very easily make your own palettes. So for example, in this little Altoids tin, I've just got four little half pans. So these are the Van Gogh, excuse me, the Van Gogh Dusk watercolor. So these are super granulating watercolors little Altoids tin, super cheap, and you get free mints. You can also save like metal pencil tins. So this was a Derwent pencil tin that I saved. And I just taped, like I used washi tape or maybe double stick tape to tape my half pans into it. You can put magnets on the back of your half pans because you know they sell like magnet tape and they'll stick to this. So you can build your own custom container very cheaply if you don't mind half pans. So you guys were complimenting this. These have gotten expensive. So these are basically a little bit nicer, I guess, version of this. You can get these on uh, Amazon. I think you can get them on AliExpress. I've also seen them at David's Art Center. And while I love David's, they're kind of pricey at David's. So they already come with the half pans and each half pan has a magnet on them. And then you fill them yourself. So that can also, and these also um, a little bit more modular, they stack a little bit better than say these where they have, I never use the mixing palettes in mine. If you do, that's great. I don't, and I find that they tend to slip and slide all over the place. So um, if you need a, like a storage system, you could do this. And like I said, I have like a big Derwent tin that I basically want to, turn into something like this where I have the magnets at the bottom and it holds all my paints. So um, you also have, uh, there's all kinds of cool palette options out there. I'm not even going to be able to touch on all of them, but we can talk about, so this thing is gross, okay? I've had this forever. This is a Magello like bulletproof palette. So this thing has been through hell and back. Um, it's supposed to be airtight. It uh, is gross. Um, it does have a gasket in the top. And then this tray is supposed to be removable, but it's hard to get out. This is the Paul Rubens version that comes with their one of their 24 watercolor kits. I like this better, actually. So this one has a very easily removable uh, mixing tray. The gasket is a little bit more inset, so it's not as easy to remove. Although I'm sure you could if you tried. It also comes with this, which might be a paint scraper, but it's also used to just remove the whole thing if you need to. Uh, this palette is supposed to keep these paints fresh. Uh, they are mostly dry. You could, but I just honestly, 
th that's never stopped me. I just spritz them with like a spray bottle of water, t t t t give them a couple minutes to soak up that water and they're ready to go. Like that's never been a big deal killer for me. But if you like Mayan blue, which has a tendency to turn to clay as it dries out in your palette and then you can never resuscitate it, then you know you might want an airtight palette. And then they also make like the Stay Fresh palettes that have like a sponge. In fact, I think that's what this area might be for is to hold a sponge. You guys let me know. <clears throat> My water fell, had to go, had to go on a rescue mission. So I actually really like this palette and I like the Paul Rubens watercolors that came with the palette. They sent tubes. So as I use these colors up, I do need to refill them. This is a little bit big for my desk though. I mean, if you don't have a lot of room, something like this out and about is gonna take up a fair chunk of your desk. So that's another reason why some people prefer like the half pan palettes. Now, if you do like smaller palettes, Superior makes, I really like this thing. This is a travel palette. This thing is very neat. I've talked about this before, but I'll talk about it again. So it comes with an expandable water bucket and it's a pretty generous size water bucket. It also has space for your brushes and you can also rest your brushes on the top. And then inside you have a small mixing surface. You have a silicone gasket that keeps your paints fresh. So I really like this thing as a travel palette option. And it's also not, not that big. So if you're working with limited desk space, something like that, it holds a lot of colors too for its size. It's um, like 16, I mean, you don't get full pans, four of them are basically half size, but that's a generous amount of paint. I don't think you're gonna miss it. Um, and it holds 16 colors in a very compact form. So I actually really like this thing and you can fill it with whatever you like, whatever two watercolors you like. So I have a bunch of different brands. This is my botanical painting palette. So it's got like opera rose in there, just stuff that generally I would not necessarily use in a palette because I'm painting flowers and it comes in other colors. It's not just pink. And then I have two new palettes. These are okay. I will do, I got these at David's art supply. I know I overpaid. I know I could get these both on AliExpress, but David's is a local art supply chain and I like supporting them. So when I can, I buy from them, even if I know I'm paying extra. So this is my first time taking a look at this thing. Um, this one I've already looked at and I already have plans for these. Uh, I am going to use my, so I have the PW, the Shinhan Professional Korean color. So they're gonna go in this. It's just a bamboo box with half pants, but oh, it's laser cut too. In, oh, somebody could easily fabricate something like that with a little bit of time and patience. Two things I don't have. Um, anyway, it's just a nice looking little watercolor palette, no mixing surfaces, but as you guys have seen, I don't use mixing surfaces when they provide me with mixing surfaces. So that's fine with me. I, I prefer a compact package. And then this one is like a stay wet kind of watercolor palette. So I'm going to use this with my My Marie Blue watercolors. And this has, this is my first time looking at it. So forgive me, but it has a bunch of little clips and then inside is a silicone gasket in the lid. So that's going to help it stay fresh. Oh, okay. That's kind of neat. I wasn't expecting all that. Uh, and then it's got some pretty generous little paint wells. It does have the thumb ring that I never use. And then I think this is supposed to be a mixing surface that you could like attach to the side. So I was going to use this with my Mimery Blue watercolors. So that's neat. So you, you do have a lot of different options for storing your paint and there's new innovative things being introduced all the time. Like the silicone gasket watercolor boxes are a fairly new thing. Give me, oh, all right. I get to talk about mixing surfaces. Give me a sec and I'll read up the chat and get caught up. 
Uh, Emily asked if I've ever tried Van Gogh watercolors. I have. Um, so Van Gogh is the student grade of Royal Talon. So Rembrandt would be their professional grade. Van Gogh is okay, but they're kind of expensive for what they are. Um, I do think they're super granulating colors. Or not, well, they call them their dust colors, but basically what they have is they have like PBK 11 or Lunar Black as the granulating black color. And then they have a staining color. So often a dioxine purple or a quinacridone magenta as the uh, lighter color. So that's how you get that kind of neat color separation. I think these are neat. And I think they've been doing some neat special effects watercolors that I haven't had a chance to play around with too much, mostly because uh, they don't really sell Van Gogh open stock where I live. So I'd have to do a big Blick order. Um, but generally, I feel uh, I'm not a big student grade person, both the price and the performance. So like if you're using them and liking them, that's awesome. Um, but when I've used them, I do a lot of layers and I find they tend to turn kind of muddy and opaque and that's not a quality I like. But I also noticed that about their professional line. So I think that just might be. Um, and I've also noticed that with a lot of, um, like German and, uh, like Amsterdam area watercolors have this tendency to be more opaque than I would have liked because, uh, Lucas, what is it? 1864 does that too. And Lucas studio is terrible. So, um, I think it's just like a, a taste, a preference thing that I just don't have. Ooh, Stylex Aquel Farben. I wonder if that's, I'm gonna look that up after the stream. Go ahead and copy it, taking notes. No, I closed it. <laughs> um, uh, you can definitely customize your own palette. So with most of these palettes, if you want to put in some whole pans and some half pans, go for it. And Dawn is making their own watercolor. That's pretty cool. Uh, Anna Downia, I get novelty tins from Amazon shaped like tabletop dice, sugar skulls, and Nintendo. Yes, those are so cute. Yeah, so you can you can use any kind of in general like small flat container to hold your watercolors. And if you want them to be magnetic, just make sure it's metal. Shoot, I have a couple of friends who they just use like a sheet of metal and they have magnets on their half pans and that's it. They don't even have like a cover for it because they're not bringing it with them anywhere. So they just work like that. Uh, Calvin said, it's only expensive if you don't already own the equipment for 3D printing. Mm, I don't know. I feel like ABS plastic is kind of kind of spendy here. And you're also using a lot of electricity to melt it. I just, I feel like, this is just me. I feel like um, half pans are pretty inexpensive and pretty common to get. So like for me, it would not be a good use of the printer time. Uh, that said though, Kabocha's got me, this is one of, of hers, but she, she linked me um, a small watercolor palette mold and you can use resin to fill that. So who am I to judge? If you can make a watercolor from epoxy resin, you can use some of the, oh, I wish, I wish Kabocha was in tonight. They could tell you, um, you can use some of the same pigments that you might use for resin to make your own watercolors. You can also use some of the same pigments that are sold for cosmetics to make watercolors. Um, uh, Kabocha talks about that a lot in our handmade watercolor stream, uh, but I know she's also learned a lot more about it since. And Nancy said that would be great for gouache. I imagine you're talking about this. Yes, that would be great for gouache. Uh, I see the clip 
transparent palette on eBay all the time. Oh yeah, I mean, it's it's been in and out of my AliExpress uh, cart for like a year now. Um, they are kind, okay, so Calvin said the dust watercolor is similar to the lunar watercolor in Daniel Smith. Yes and no. So I have several of the lunar colors in this palette. Some of the lunar colors have um, an additional color in them that isn't just uh, the pigment color and BBK 11. And now I cannot remember which ones, <laughs> which ones are which, but uh, th I did this as a stream and we talked about it on the stream. So I'll just have to like link that in the description. Um, but yeah, the dust, also I think there's only like four dust colors. Now you can make your own dust colors by using PBK, so lunar black, and mixing it with like a single pigment or a quinacridone, and you can get some really nice colors. And I actually showed that in my dust color review. So um, they're fun to have, but you don't have to have them. But if you don't feel like mixing them, they're fun to have. Uh, hi, Becca, please link store for the superior palette. I will try to remember to do that before the, I have to dig for it is the problem. And Nancy, oh man, okay, I'm gonna start copying y'all's requests so that I can make sure I do that and have that in the description. Cause I don't mind doing it. I just like, I have legit ADHD and I don't wanna forget. Uh, if I don't, okay, all right, I am, I am caught up. So, hydration is great. Let me, let me clear some of this off and we can talk about mixing surfaces and mixing surfaces are again. So one of the things I love about watercolor is so much of what you do and what your experiences are and what materials you're going to use. It's all about what you want to make. So that also includes your mixing surfaces. It really kind of boils down to what are you, what are you hoping to make? So I'll show you what I'm currently using. It's act, it's not what I use when I do watercolor comics, but I am hoping to upgrade after we've moved to like larger all ceramic multi-well palettes for the comics because I mean, like uh, the Frugal Crafter was right. Those are a better mixing experience. I was just using plastic because I was traveling a lot and plastic is lightweight easy to replace and not as likely to break. Whereas ceramic doesn't travel as nicely. So uh, while I'm grabbing some stuff, rather than AFK, I'll just uh, put some art out for y'all to admire for a moment. Oh yes, the, the looking out for extra additives is a big deal, especially if they're adding things that have like, like uh, shea butter, stuff like that, that would change the water solubility. Oh no, they're not vinyl stickers. They're just round watercolor paper. Okay, so mixing surfaces. That This is gonna be such a your mileage may vary situation. So just, this is just what I like and what I use. I typically like to use non-porous white sealed surfaces. So in the past, I used to use these very cheap plastic watercolor rounds a lot because when I'm painting a watercolor comic, I need to be able to mix up a fair amount of a lot of different colors. So I would often have two of these going at any given time, along with some plastic dishes very similar to this for larger washes. 
I would also scavenge, um, you know, if you get mochi ice cream in the store, it's got like the six weld container. I would use those as well. Very lightweight, very easy to replace, very cheap, not likely to break. So they're fine. Um, now that I am more stationary, I am actually using, this is just a plate from Dollar Tree, like just a white ceramic plate, a buck. I use this thing all the time. You can get larger plates, um, very easy to clean, heavier, more likely to break, but also very easy to replace if you do break it. You can also go to, I don't know about y'all, but my Asian supermarket sells uh, ceramic, white ceramic tableware. So I got a bunch of little sauce dishes that I use when I'm mixing up larger washes. You can also get these kind of containers. These are, I think, designed for Chinese watercolor and um, some sumi, but they're, they're like 13 bucks a pop. So they're kind of expensive for this. The sauce containers work quite well as well. And you can also get ceramic multi-well palettes. They're cheaper online, excuse me, than in person. It might arrive broken. Um, I have it somewhere, you know, when I moved, I packed a box of all the stuff I wanted to be able to access immediately. And that's the box I can't find. Uh, Kabocha sent me a rose palette. And it's just in the shape of a rose and it's got lots and lots of little wells and it's ceramic. And I really like that palette as well. So for single standalone illustrations, I find this, this, and this to be plenty. I mostly use this when I'm mixing up skin tones and I need that consistent color. If I'm just doing floral paintings, I just use this because getting consistent color isn't really that important. So that's what I'm currently using. I, and I really wanna buy more ceramic palettes. Um, I know there's a lot of options and I'm just kind of waiting until I have a larger workspace and can justify having my whole table taken up with you know nice ceramic uh, tableware. Uh, yes, you do hear ceramic, but mostly I try to get the cheap stuff because you don't actually need the fancy designated for art stuff to use it for art. Like I said, Dollar Tree. You could also hit up Goodwill, a secondhand store. You could raid your own cabinet for, for that. If you don't mind painting on something that has a pattern already, I'm sure you could find really, really cheap stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't use, oh, that's gross. It's got like chocolate on it. I don't want to show you all that. That's shameful, but I will. Anyway, you could even use like small saucers, that kind of thing. So um, what's nice about these is you can clean them off very easily. You can also reactivate the color on them and ceramic is not as likely to stain as plastic. So that's what I like to use as my mixing sur surfaces. You can also use um, what's known as a butcher's tray. And I have one and I don't really use it mainly because even though I have a small one now, I have a bigger one too. It just takes up room on my table that I don't have. And that's made of metal and it's been coated with enamel. So basically you want something with like a non-stick, like a glazed surface or an enamel surface and non-porous. Um, I do have a large rectangular uh, metal enamel tray. That bigger one is, I used to like using that for like doing brush -o stuff. And I have a feeling I'm gonna be using that again when I'm getting into printmaking again, but it's packed up. Yes, yes, ceramic egg holders would be great for that. Oh, nice. Ceramic palettes are a lot of fun to paint on. Uh, one of my friends makes multiple sizes of stickers out of almost everything she paints and she has one of those sticker machines in the house, those Zylon machines. I gotcha. Um, yeah, that is a neat idea. It's a nice way to kind of get your art out there too. And Nancy said, I got a stack of seven heavy Pottery Barn white sausage for 50 cents each. Yes. Man, I miss going to the thrift store, especially in the ceramic section because you can find all sorts of goodies. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so I guess I kind of want to talk about um, all the other miscellaneous painting stuff. Oh, brushes. I'll talk about brushes first and then we'll talk about the miscellaneous. So let me go grab those because I had to wash a bunch of them.
there used to be a really nice Goodwill boutique on in Old Metairie that had like they really curated it. They had great stuff, but it closed. So womp womp womp. So uh, as with every part of this conversation, um, what brushes you like, what fibers you like, it's really going to be a matter of taste. So what I'm showing you guys is kind of what I like and what I, I know that's obvious. Um, I, I'm a brush hoarder. I have a lot of watercolor brushes because I wanted to try and, and just try things out and see what I like. So, you know, these are the things that I like. Um, so generally, whew, how do I start? Do I start in terms of order that I use them on the paper? I don't want to start in terms of order of preference because um, that is a lot of brushes. Yeah, I have more brushes. These are the ones I like. I have a lot of brushes I don't like that I, I save for projects that I know they're going to get wrecked because I didn't like them when I tried them. Okay. I guess I'll just talk about the different brush types to begin with, and then we can kind of work our way in. And this isn't all inclusive of all brush types ever. So this is um, a type of hockey brush. It's more of an Americanized one because it's, it's definitely got that metal ferrule. Um, what I like to use hockey brushes for, this brush is only used when I'm stretching watercolor paper. I only use this with just clean water. I don't use it with paint. And even so, it's starting to rust, even though I try to be very careful with it. So boom, boom, what you gonna do? This is like a more traditional hockey, br hockey brush in that it doesn't have the metal ferrule. It's held in place with like a pinch motion. This one I will sometimes use for larger washes. I like hockey brushes in that they are usually less expensive than a similar size brush of their, you know, other counterparts. My complaint, is that these things like this one I bought it and I can't use it because it is constantly shedding hair and I know brushes will shed hair but this thing has never stopped shedding hair no matter how many times I clean it and I gently kind of pull out you know the stray hairs like that it will shed hair all over my painting so this one doesn't do that that one doesn't do that um, I really like these for stretching and large applications of water you can find those at, uh, not, not like Michael's and stuff, but like David's would have it, Blick would have it. Um, so more dedicated to art supplies, art supply stores. In a similar vein, um, I do like Sumi and Menso style brushes. Um, you could really go into a whole conversation about Sumi and Menso style brushes and the different fibers and how those are utilized and when those are utilized, and I do not remember that off the top of my head, so I'm not going to do that. But I find that if you like painting with natural hair fibers, if you don't have a problem with using those, and some people do, and I respect that, uh, Sumi brushes and Mento brushes are a great way to get larger brush sizes more affordably than if you were to buy like a watercolor round. Um, I don't necessarily find that they handle all that differently. I also do a lot of edigami style paintings. So I use these with uh, Gansai style watercolors a lot. So I don't know. Um, so Sumi brushes are definitely not to be overlooked because they can be an affordable way to have some half decent or decent watercolor brushes in your collection that you enjoy using. So moving from Sumi brushes, which was the briefest introduction, Generally, for the kind of illustrations I paint, so comic pages and illustrations, I am typically using what's known as round watercolor brushes. And rounds are round and they come to a tapered point. You really want them to come to a nice tapered point like this one. And watercolor brushes are typically made of three different classes, I guess, of fiber, three different types of fiber. So you have natural hair, which could be Kalinsky Sable, which is some of the best, or Squirrel, which is all right, or Camel, which is actually Pony, which is not so great. It's, do I have any or have I? Yeah, I do. I do. I like to keep some of the bad ones around. Okay, so that is quote unquote Camel. It's, it's, it's not fun. It's gross. It's not fun to paint with. Um, 
generally with natural hair brushes, they can hold more water. They can come to a finer point. It can be a nicer painting experience depending on what you're looking for and what you want. One of my best friends hates natural hair brushes. They just don't like painting with them and they prefer synthetic. So it's a, your mileage may vary sort of situation. Natural hair brushes, especially like Kalinsky Sable, get very expensive. So this is like a $70 brush right here. Um, and so you wanna take good care of them if you do have them. This one has some brush soap in it just to help preserve the point. And we'll talk about conditioning and taking care of your brushes in just a minute. I have these little red caps on the back because I recently got this thing that allows me to hang my brushes upside down, which is great because when you hang your brushes upside down, it allows the fibers to come to a point. If you dry them standing up like this in a, in a cup, which I've done for years, then you end up with this where all where gravity has kind of splayed the fibers out it's ruined the belly of the brush it's ruined the brush's ability to come to a point um, so i really actually like my brush hanging system okay so kolinsky sable squirrel next you have mixed fiber brushes Right now, mixed fiber brushes are my favorite because, well, depending on the brand, not all brands are the best, but I really like silver black velvet brushes. As you guys can see, I have a lot of them. I use them all the time now because they're just good workhorse brushes. They're a combination of squirrel and synthetic fiber. They come to a nice point. Generally with synthetics, I find that you see how this thing is just kind of like straight up and down this thing is kind of bowed out in the middle. That's the belly that holds your water, that holds your paint. Um, synthetic brushes, I find just drip drop the water all over and I have a lot of water control issues. I don't have that problem with silver black velvet brushes. They're kind of expensive for synthetic brushes, but they're cheaper than natural hair brushes. They are resilient. I can abuse the heck out of these things and they still come back for more. And to me, they're like a decent investment brush if you're a bit abusive to your art supplies the way I am, um, these are going to reward you for your money, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, I mostly have their rounds. They do have a rigger. It's a script brush or a rigger or a liner. And that's just a round that has a super duper duper long point. I've never used this brush, so this is only half as gross as it looks. Mind of Watercolor says that if you have control issues, these are actually easier because all of this kind of stabilizes the line. Like if you have shaky hands, all this kind of helps stabilize it. I believe him. I just haven't tested it out myself yet. Um, I mean to, I just haven't. So someday, someday I will. So typically with watercolor brushes, especially rounds, the larger you get in size. So the number corresponds to the size, but much like women's jeans, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, a five in one size is not going to be a five in another brand, you know? So uh, you kind of just have to eyeball it and go with what you know. Uh, but typically with uh, natural hair brushes, once you start getting into the larger sizes, they get super <laughs> expensive, like, like a couple hundred dollars. But with synthetics, they're much cheaper. So a brush like this, if it were a natural hair brush, that would be like a hundred dollars or more, depending on what the what fiber it is. If it's squirrel, it'd be a hundred. If it's Kalinsky Sable, well, I hope you I hope you have a car you can sell. I guess, but with synthetic, it's like fourteen dollars. So for me, and the money I make from watercolor, which is not 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 a lot, like let's be real, not a lot of money. I find that for the best bang for my buck, the money that I have. I buy full synthetics for the larger sizes, which can be really useful to have. And I buy uh, mixed, the silver black velvet for the medium sizes because it's still way more economical than their, their full natural counterparts. And I don't necessarily notice a whole lot of the difference, but when it counts, so for smaller sizes, for inking, especially for inking, I never ink with a synthetic, but um, for that, I go with Kalinsky Sable. And then I treat it like it's my baby and I try to preserve it while still using it. Cause you know, if you don't use art supplies, it's not really, 
why have them, you know, like just to look pretty and feel good about having this thing. So we talked about rounds. These are flats. They look like flats. They look like a paintbrush. Um, I don't have a lot of flats mainly because I don't use them all that often. I find them useful in landscape painting um, or for, for different art styles than what I typically do where I'm blocking in the shapes just to get out of my own head. But uh, I don't use flats all that often, but some, you know, some people do. It's just a, a what are you going to use sort of situation. Um, so when you see bristles that are like this color, that's a uh, golden taclon. It's a synthetic. Um, it's fine. This is also a synthetic. I think it's like the mimic. It's also taclon. It's fine. They actually put a little bit of a wave in the fibers. So it holds water a little bit better than just this, which is just straight synthetic fibers. This doesn't hold water hardly at all. Uh, this is a mop. It looks kind of, it looks like a makeup brush. It looks like a mop. I have a larger, oh, there it is. I've been looking for you. Come here, come here. Actually, I have a couple, couple, come here. All right, so uh, this is a larger mop. It's a synthetic, it's a Cotman, it's a cheaper one. Um, I've been using these forever. To me, I don't see the point in spending a bunch of money on a mop because for me, I basically just use this to put a toning wash down on my paper and then I don't really use it a whole lot after that. Apparently, once upon a time, I bought a, I think this is goat. I bought a, uh, a, a goat Windsor & Newton mop and I don't think I've ever used it because look how white that is. I don't, maybe some, maybe somebody gave it to me. I don't even know why I have this, what possessed me to buy that, but I have it. And uh, it also wants to shed hair. And then you have, um, there are other watercolor brushes, obviously, but for what I use, you have what's known as a cat's tongue or a filbert. So it's kind of like a flat, but it's also kind of an oval shape at the top. I've used this one so much that the ferrule is super duper loose. I'm surprised it hasn't just come right off. Um, when cleaning my watercolor brushes, I clean my brushes every time I finish a painting. I don't necessarily clean them in between. Um, I like to use Old Masters brush soap. Uh, I've tried other brush soaps and I find that they strip all the oils out of the, the hair and it kind of like makes them all bushy and I can't draw a point with them anymore. So, uh, oh yeah, the white one really looks like a makeup brush. I don't, maybe it got sent to me in like an art snacks or something. I couldn't tell you why I have it. Um, and Anna Danya points out that hanging the brush as the water dr drops off and set it down into the handle and the ferrule. Yes, and that's going to help preserve. Thank you. That's gonna, I forgot about that. That's gonna help preserve the lifespan of your brush. Um, and have a good evening, Liz. Get a good night's sleep. So um, brush soap, not super expensive. You can get the little travel sizes. You can get the bigger sizes. It lasts a while. You can use baby shampoo in your watercolor brushes as well. Uh, if you use baby shampoo though, I do recommend you also buy baby conditioner and you condition your brushes every so often because it is, it's still hair. And if you treat it terribly, it's not gonna respond well. But one of the big uses for using brush soap in the middle of a watercolor illustration is when I'm using masking fluid. So when I'm using masking fluid, I will go ahead and soap up my brush and that helps protect the bristles. It helps protect the ferrule from absorbing my masking fluid. So I'll soap it up. And I actually like to pour off a little bit of masking fluid in a small container like this because masking fluid is latex based, it will rot with exposure to air. So if your masking fluid starts to smell nasty, throw it away because it started to rot and it's not gonna perform as well anyway. So earlier we were talking about masking fluid pens. Those are fun. Um, I have not had the best of success with them. I love the concept, but they always clog on me. Um, and I try cleaning them even with something that I know, like with some of them, they have removable nibs and I'll soak them in something that I know is a solvent for latex and I still can't get them 100% clean. So my, my best experience is just with a brush and brush soap and dipping it in and applying it like that. But uh, in the Hikilia box, they sent the Lamasque Extra Fine. And once I got used to that, I kind of liked that. 
but to me this is still a lot easier than um, using the pens but that's because I've really struggled with the the pens are we done so uh, Hima asked if the if the cat's tongue feels like a cat's tongue no it's way softer and Joseph said I might be able to use pliers to tighten the ferrule see there you go that's a good idea or maybe a couple of drops of glue in there might, but I think the pliers are probably a better fix. Um, and Calvin said, I wish there, oh, this stinking bottle has been so leaky. I have to wash this off because I'm actually allergic to latex. So I will do that and be right back. And then I'll talk about removing latex. Yeah, um, if you, well, I mean, try it. Like, just because I, so this is regarding uh, Nancy and the travel journal. Like, I've seen other people talk about the masking fluid pens and they really liked them. I don't know if I've gotten a couple bum ones or if they were older ones or, you know, like there's so many kind of, uh, I don't know if they were stored in the heat, you know, so... Like I had, a, I had like a not great experience with them, but that doesn't mean they're that they're like a hundred, hundred percent bad. Does that make sense? Um, I really liked them while they were working. I really liked the masking fluid in them. The Molotol one has a blue masking fluid and it's very easy to remove. And the Pobio has a blue masking fluid and you can get a finer line with it and it's very easy to remove. So like the masking fluids they included were both fine. Now Schminka makes, a masking fluid and like a small I mean when you go to the store um you'll like sorry brain brain is like <laughs> blue screen of death give me a sec depending on your art supply store because like I'm spoiled because David's has got like a lot of masking fluid um they have a really good masking fluid selection so I'm spoiled for choice but you what was it called the Le mask extra fine could be a good one and if you need a, tut a mini tutorial on washing your watercolor brushes, uh, let me know. I'm happy to do it. I think I have some videos too where I show how you can use conditioner to uh, help you reshape it. And if you're working with natural fibers, there's a water method that you can use to help reshape a brush. And if you have a synthetic brush that when you were storing it, it got bent, you can use boiling water so long as you don't submerge it past the ferrule. Because, and you don't ever want to use hot water when you're cleaning your brushes because it'll dissolve the glue that holds the, uh, the fibers into the ferrule itself. You should totally use dirt cheap brushes for masking fluid. That's what they're for. Yes, please don't use expensive brushes for masking fluid. Get the cheapy ones. Get the Walmart special ones. So um, I talk about masking fluid a lot. Uh, I used to hate it. Now I'm now we're on okay terms. Um, 
So I used to really struggle with using it. And one of the things that has helped me with masking fluid is this here. This thing is a masking fluid pickup. Some, some people can just use their finger and like it'll naturally kind of pick up the masking fluid. My hands are too dry for that, so it doesn't work. This is basically made of the same thing that masking is made of latex. And uh, in fact, I spilled some on this one and I can't, it's now permanently fused to it. So uh, it just basically stickies to it and helps pick it up and makes removing it a little bit easier if you're somebody who kind of struggles to get your masking fluid off your paper like me. Whew, 1030, it's getting late, but I still got talking to do. And thank you guys for asking questions. It's so helpful. Um, I don't want to burr. See, a lot of this is just getting piled up as you guys look at my butt, uh, getting piled up around my desk and I'm going to put it away after. So, uh, I was talking about the red clips or the red caps that I had on my brushes. So I like them so much. I have more of them. Um, and this isn't really the full system, but basically you buy, uh, there's like two different main units you can buy. The kind that can clamp onto your desk and it's got a rod and it's got like a little headpiece and then you put these wiggly wire things spiraling out or you can buy the kind that clamps to your canvas and it just has like one arm or two arms that spiral out but basically the way these things work is this thing slots into something and let me grab my brush you put this cap on your brush this one's on good sometimes I have trouble getting them to stay on but they're supposed to be a little flexy I find they're supposed to fit any size brush it says fits all brushes that's bull the smaller brushes it will not fit on them so I have to use rubber bands to help me out can you use masking fluid on top of dried watercolor you sure can um well you should be able to some brands will tear the paper regardless and you can't really use masking fluid on all types of watercolor paper. Like Shizen really does not like masking fluid, but you should be able to use masking fluid on top of dried watercolor. You can use dip pens and those plastic pottery shaper tool. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, you know, I, the, the silicone ones. And you can use, where did I put it? I have a, a line, a ruling tool. We talked about it when I was doing the Hikilia box. I'm gonna say her name differently every time and one of these days I'll get it right. Um, anyway, there's a lot of different ways you can apply masking fluid. I did put them, yeah, that's right. I did do the, the, dry, the masking fluid on top of dry watercolor and it didn't eat my paper. Anyway, so this thing and then you hook it and then, oh, it's like a stupid little gnome cap. I don't know if it'll show. But I actually, it, they're kind of expensive, but I feel like I'm probably going to be using this for at least the next 15 years of my painting life. So I figure if it makes my brushes last longer and I don't have to replace brushes because they got ruined and I like it as a storage solution, then it's worth the investment. And you can get these on, on Blick. You can also, if you live in, in Metairie or New Orleans or Louisiana, you can get them at David's Art Supply, which is where I got, got them at first. making noises, weird noises. I'm gonna talk a little bit about miscellaneous, there's so many watercolor toys. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about miscellaneous watercolor stuff that I like. Um, and then I'll talk about paper. Where is my, there it is. I don't know why I did not know where that was. You need to go to David's. Yes, they have so many things and it smells good. It smells like art supplies. Okay, let me check. All right, you guys can see that's good. Okay, so um, some, let me put aside the more miscellaneous miscellaneous and we'll start by talking about the materials I like to use when I'm stretching watercolor paper. Uh, and this is, this is the method that works for me. You're totally welcome to find your own method. You're totally welcome to take my method and adjust it to fit what you like. 
uh, it will not offend me. And so it's actually gotten kind of weird because I'm seeing a lot of people I look up to using my method and uh, it'd be cool if they ever gave me a shout out, but I guess it got kind of like, I guess the information got kind of disseminated or something. I don't know. Give me, give me a sec. I mean, you probably could stick them to a piece of duct tape, but well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you've, uh, um, this is just a standalone illustration. I, to be like real, real, um, I've been trying to work on Kara and I've been really just kind of depressed and, um, it's just been kind of hard to focus on it. I'm hoping that after we move, I will, um, feel kind of reinvigorated to work on Kara. Um, yeah, chap chapter, the, the first chapter of volume three is still in the scripting phase. It's coming along, but I, all y'all with depression know how hard it is to write stuff when, when, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so when I'm stretching watercolor, <laughs> oh boy, this is like, where do I, where do I start? Do you guys want, do you guys want like the long version or can I give y'all the short version and then I'm like why is this paper kind of dirty because it's it's just waiting for me to paint it and this is inspired by the lo-fi girl I just <laughs> had to um so whether I'm working on cellulose paper or cotton rag paper if I'm working on a larger piece I'll always stretch my watercolor paper um oh thank you Nancy I appreciate that and um with this, I ran it through the printer and I printed these really faint blue lines and I penciled that. So I did my sketch digitally and that allows it to look really pretty clean when I pencil it. But then I have, why is it dirty? Um, but then I have the problem of um, needing to remove those blue lines before I paint because the dye is water soluble and I don't want it just like coming up randomly when I'm mixing a skin tone or something and kind of polluting the color and making the color difficult to predict. So that's one of the reasons I always stretch my watercolor illustration will reactivate that blue dye and I can use my paper towels to kind of soak it up. This is going to bug me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Hopefully that's, that's good. Any, anyway, so I'm not going to walk you guys through my watercolor paper stretching method unless y'all want a demo for, watercolor uh, stretching, but I, I do it in a lot of my tutorials, so I don't necessarily feel like I need to do that now. I stretch my watercolor paper on plastic signboard, like it's called chloroplast. I got it on Amazon because I wanted just plain white sheets of it and I cut it down to size, but you can use political signs for this too, just clean them off first. Um, so that could be a great way to repurpose <laughs> something that's just sitting around. Ask your neighbor, ask your friends. It is pretty inexpensive and I think you can get it at most home and garden stores, probably not Walmart. Foam core, so the stuff that's like got paper on the outside and foamy, you can kind of use it for that. But I mean, once you saturate it with water, it's done for. Cause I know people who will use um, cardboard for this, but it's a one use sort of thing. So um, I prefer using Viva paper towels for this because as you guys can see, it doesn't, I mean, it has a texture, but it's almost the same texture as the watercolor paper. And it's not, there's no pattern on it. There's, so it's not gonna leave ink and it's not going to leave a, a weird pattern. And I found that with cheaper paper towels, I do get a weird pattern with it. And I like to use, so I've tried lots of different tapes. I've tried different masking tapes. I've tried illustrator tape. I've tried watercolor tape, scotch, original blue painters tape, the crepe kind. So not the foamy kind, the crepe kind is the best I have found. And that's why I say it's kind of weird because when I started using this, people were using white masking tape and they were using illustrator tape. And my mom just happened to have a roll of this at her house. And I was kind of annoyed with all the other tapes. So I stole it from her with her, I guess with her knowledge, I took it and I tried it and I liked it better. So that's why it's a little weird when I see people I look up to using it and we've never talked because it's like, I wonder how they found out about it. 
But, you know, that's cool. Information does disseminate on the internet. I'm really glad they found something that they like. I use this so much, I buy it in bulk. Um, I will buy like the 12 rolls at a time. And uh, I used to use it a lot in my convention setups as well. But my trick for this is I don't apply dry tape to wet paper. I actually will put it on my arm and run water on it so that it's wet tape on wet paper. And I find that that sticks better. And then just to hold it secure, because it will mostly seal around the paper. Sometimes you do have to press it back down again. Um, I use binder clips, like size four, the largest binder clips and bulldog clips. And the bulldog clips, the binder clips and the chloroplast are a one-time investment. It's, it's not, you don't have to replace it. You're, it's not gonna degrade unless you're just like terrible. You take terrible care of it. So um, it's one of those things that you're just gonna use for years. So to me, it's kind of worth the money. I also like to have a spray bottle of water handy and I spray what I'm stretching first with water and then I brush on my water using my hockey brush. I roll my paper towels across it to remove excess water, flip it over and then do the other side. And then I let it dry fully before I ever try to paint it. Um, so the, the, Coroplast board, I really recommend it. It's super lightweight. It's gonna last you a long time. You can basically get it for free. The Scotch or 3M blue painters tape, the crepe kind. I like a wider one because I also tape it to the back. It helps it just stay a little bit more secure. Um, and this is helping to hold the paper tight when I'm adding layer and layer and layer and layer and layer of water. The bulldog clips and the binder clips help with that as well. And also for like edges where it's just slightly too far for me to get a binder clip on, I will flip this down and it just helps to hold it flat. And I've painted literally hundreds of comic pages that way and so many illustrations. So there might be a better way. I've, I've tried watercolor tape, which you literally just cut the edge off your watercolor because you can't remove it and, or it's not designed to be removed. I thought it, I thought you were supposed to be able to remove it, you're not. Um, and then some of the masking tapes I've tried tear into my illustration rather than not tearing or very gently abrading the paper rather than, you know, tearing in. So that's why I like, the blue painter's tape is painter's tape. So it's supposed to be for delicate surfaces. Um, I also, wait, uh, ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba, let me get caught up a little bit. Ah, I hope you have a good evening, Dawn. Looking at the artist brush line on Blick and I and my cat might not be a good outcome. <laughs> uh talking about oh okay using blue tack yeah you could maybe try that i gotcha like poster tack yeah that's a that's a good idea and yeah and it is reusable okay so um me i like using a water i really want to move to a bigger water cup uh, the space I have, I would usually, I used to use two, a clean and a dirty. In fact, it literally says clean on it, despite being filthy. I just don't have space for two cups, but using two cups does help prevent your watercolors from becoming muddy from polluted water as quickly. Um, I like the click and go cups, not because I ever click them, but because they don't look like drinking cups. So I never drink my watercolor water and the crenellations will hold your brushes. So... I use that pretty frequently. And I also have a really gross looking paint puck. It's just a silicone scrubber that you can put at the bottom of your paint cup. And I find that it actually really helps get my brushes cleaner. So I'm not applying old color to my watercolor illustration. I've talked about those a lot in the past because I used to really, really like them. I also swear by having a drafting brush. You guys already saw me use it. I use it when I'm penciling illustrations or if I'm removing pencils from inks. These things are underappreciated. You don't have to use your hand to do it. It does a much better job. It can also remove salt from a watercolor illustration if you do sprinkle salt on it. And it's a one-time purchase unless you just ruin it. So um, I've had this one since the beginning of undergrad, maybe high school. So it will last you a really, really long time. 
Uh, I, uh, yes. Hema asked if I literally get up and, re and go refill it in the bathroom every so often. I do, yes. Because it gets nasty. And once the water gets brown, you know that that color is going to start migrating to whatever you're painting. And if you're trying to do like a really light wash of blue, you really don't want that. So um, before we talk about paper, which is kind of the last thing I plan on talking about tonight, unless you guys got questions. Um, this is a paint key. So if you have trouble getting all the paint out of your watercolor tube, you thread it through the bottom. This one is a little bit deformed, so it's going to be a little harder to do. You thread it through the bottom and then you twist it up and it'll push all that little bit of paint that gets stuck in there up to the top. So this one is not quite used up enough for it to be useful. Um, honestly, you can reuse these, just unroll it and remove it when you're done. This is a palette knife. I don't ever use it for mixing paint, but I do use it for removing paper from a watercolor block. You guys, give me a second. I can grab an example. Everything ends up piled in front of the cabinets where I store all my stuff. I think real swifty. Oh, come on. I'm looking for some cheap paper because, I mean, once I remove it from the block, it's not ruined, but, you know, here we go. This is, this is basically a joke. It came with a Shapiro Farben. I mean, it's not literally a joke, but it feels like a joke. It's, uh, it's cellulose, but it's really bad cellulose watercolor paper that has been bound in a block format. So... If you are working on a watercolor block like this, where your watercolor paper is secured on at least two sides, you probably don't need to stretch your watercolor paper unless you remove it from the block. Um, because this is supposed to hold your watercolor paper tight as you add water. So that's why I do, that's one of the reasons I do the mud test when I'm reviewing watercolor papers, is I wanna see if adding a bunch of water is gonna force the paper to buckle off of the block and you know, basically defeat the purpose of a block. So with this, I used to use an X-Acto blade to do this. I was a fool. It is so easy and you won't cut yourself to remove watercolor paper from a block. Paul Rubin sent me this a while back when I ordered some of their watercolor paper. They also have a cute, there's also like a cute leaf version of this. I think it looks like, what is it, a kunai? Um, this does the same thing. And it's plastic, so you can get it through TSA. So these are both handy to have. Um, they're probably equally easy to find now. And then I like to use white gouache to add in white highlights back because I'm a rebel like that. Because I'm a... <gasps> Nancy said that she loves that I can drop words like chronolation into a conversation so casually. It's because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Um, Calvin said masking tape used to tear my watercolor paper, but that doesn't happen after I switch to Bao Hong watercolor paper. Okay, I get you. One of the other things I find that helps is I apply it to my arm because the dead skin cells will remove a little bit of the tackiness from the tape and will make it less likely to tear the paper. It is harder when you have to like want, like go in search of the bathroom. Um, so if you have the space, I do keep a, a bucket of water in here. Um, and I have during streams kept a bucket on the floor and dumped my dirty water into the bucket and just filled it like that. Um, but my bathroom isn't that far from the room that I work in. So, uh, oh, you could just use a bowling folder to remove um, watercolor sheets from a block, probably, if you have like a really thin bone folder, um, you wouldn't even need to start it with an X-Acto blade. But like I said, I don't actually have a lot of space. Like I'm putting everything on the floor right now. So I don't really have a lot of space for spare, for spare cups of water. So I just make the trips. 
Okay, so the final thing I kind of want to talk about is paper. It's going to be more of a loose conversation because I, I'm lazy and I don't feel like getting like big pads of watercolor paper. And also um, the camera doesn't really do a great job of picking up the texture on just sheets of white paper. So if you guys ever want me to go more in depth in, about watercolor paper, let me know. I'm happy to do that. I can do that tonight if you guys really want it. Um, so you can, I guess I should start by talking kind of about the differences between cellulose and uh, cotton rag paper. I am going to refill my water bottle and hopefully we, this will be like my last break and we can, we can finish this up. I picked the room that has a door out to the porch. That's that was because that little bedroom is about as small, maybe a little bigger than this room, but it also has a bed in it. Um, I don't know why I'm arguing <laughs> about this. It's not important. So um, ask me some questions about watercolor paper because there's a lot of different ways I can approach it. And it does, again, depend on your use case and your budget. And sometimes you wanna paint on a cellulose paper because of certain reasons. And sometimes you only wanna paint on a cotton rag paper because of certain reasons. Um, and sometimes you are working with what you got, where you live. Yes, a sink in the studio would be so nice. We've talked about that. And a hole, like a drain in the floor. So I can just dump the paints down the floor now. So I can uh, just hose the room out. Uh, so I guess where I'm going to start is, um, oh, geez, paper is such a, there's so, so many. Let me, I guess I'll just start from where I'm coming from, okay? So when I'm in better mental health form, I paint watercolor comic pages. So I need something, and I'm doing it on my own budget. Like I don't, I'm not working with a publisher. Watercolor projects used to be very hard to pitch to publishers because there were reproduction issues and cost issues. Now they're becoming a little bit more common. Um, have I ever painted on watercolor ground? I have, and I don't like it. Um, I know you can apply, like several brands have it, like uh, Core has it, Daniel Smith has it. And you can apply it to a surface that would generally not be receptive to watercolor to make it more receptive to watercolor. But I personally find that watercolor ground is kind of like if I were painting on like just paper mush, you know, like I don't find, I, Kabocha likes it and has painted nice things with it, but I haven't had good experiences with watercolor ground. Um, depending on what I might want to paint, I might just like glue a little piece of watercolor paper to it and paint on that. Um, so I haven't had great experience, but that's, I mean, I, I would like to try painting on unfinished wood because an artist I really admire on Instagram has done some really beautiful stuff like that. And I'd also like to try painting on silk for the same reason. I don't think my attempts would be as good as theirs, but if you know, they've inspired me to try. Um, so, as a watercolor comic artist who's painting a lot of pages, like a chapter might have 30 pages in it, I need something that is reliable, economical, I can run it through my printer. I had tried some student grade papers way back in chapter one and I hated them. They were terrible. Um, they, they buckled, the colors turned to mud, the colors would slough off the paper. 
So um, I tried Canson Mont Ball and I really liked it. I still really like it. Oh, thank you for hanging out, Nancy. I'm glad you can make it. So I still, I mean, I haven't painted on Mont Ball since last summer. So I might, I might pick it up and be like, oh, I hate it now. But in general, I think it is really good for a cellulose paper and handles a lot like a cotton rag paper and I can get it to do a lot of stuff that I can't get a cotton rag paper to do. So I have found that for me with cotton rag papers, they dry a lot slower than cellulose papers. Sometimes my colors look kind of mushy on them. Um, and it just might take me longer to paint on a cotton rag paper than on a cellulose paper because the difference is with cellulose paper, everything sits on the surface of the paper. It never soaks into the actual particles of the paper. It's all there on the surface. So that's why with cellulose paper, you can only do a certain number of layers realistically. You can only do so much blending. You can only do so much wet into wet. It's, it's a more limited paper, but in being more limited, you gain that speed. It forces you to make executive decisions and work quickly and decisively. And for someone like me who could spend forever nitpicking over one illustration, having that limiting factor helps me produce comic pages faster than I would otherwise. And I'm also able, I think, to get sharper art in a smaller area. So I paint on, um, watercolor ground is just watercolor paper mush mixed with glue and guess yeah i guess so it did seem like a, a pulp mush when i when i did try it but um so to me cellulose papers do have their pros they're also way cheaper than cotton rag papers and you can find them almost anywhere i mean you can get this XL sketchbook at Walmart, you can get it at Michael's, you can get it at an art supply store. So if you're traveling, you can find this particular brand, this particular paper, you know, almost anywhere you go. And I find that cellulose watercolor papers handle watercolor markers, both pigment based and dye based better than cotton rag papers, because for some reason it doesn't tear up the paper fibers as much um, as it does with cotton rag papers. So um, cellulose definitely has its place. Cotton rag also has its place, so it's kind of what you're looking for. So if I'm doing standalone illustrations, if I'm doing more floral illustrations, I really like, this is a Shizen hot press watercolor sketchbook. So it's got cotton rag paper in it. I can really dump water on it. I can really dump a lot of layers and color on it and I still get these really bright, vibrant colors without the paper turning to mush. And I'm painting with cheap paint in this. I'm using, this is the Mozart Como Rebbe palette for all of these. And I'm able to get some nice results out of it. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, and in that instance, I would say maybe a case by case basis. This is, gee whiz, this is, I think this is their, okay, this is the Strathmore Visual Journal. And I think it is cotton paper, but it's a mixed media cotton paper. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily have the sizing. It's not formulated to take as much water. It's not as heavy. So if you wanted to paint in a sketchbook like this, you can, but you need to limit how many layers you do. You need to limit how much blending you do. You need to limit if you're going to apply shading because it might not take shading as well, that sort of thing. But those kind of limitations, again, can be fun and can work well in a sketchbook format because they are more freeing and you're not spending as much time finessing something to get a finished product. Oh, thank you. Um, hang on. And then, I mean, we're just, this is just watercolor sketchbooks and there's all kinds of watercolor sketchbooks. Um, and I have a bunch that I actually need to take a look because I'm always on the lookout for like a good watercolor sketchbook. This really is just a sketchbook. Um, it's a cellulose paper. It's a really thin paper. It's like cardstock weight and it has like a watercolor texture embossed on it. I overworked this, but it allowed me to overwork it. So, you know, sometimes they won't. Sometimes it just kind of turns to mush on you. Whew. 
Whew. Okay. So, oh, thank you guys. Uh, my brain is turning to mush. So if you guys ask questions, I can answer questions. But if you guys don't have questions, then um, I'm just going to show you guys my swatch book which is supposed to help stop me from double buying colors, but I forget to put it in my bag when I go to the store. So really it just helps me catalog what colors and what brands I have in like an easy to compare format. And I have it sorted out by brand. You could sort it out by color and that would honestly be more useful. Uh, clearly I'm thinking about this like an art supply reviewer and not necessarily like an artist, because if you're thinking about it like an artist, you want to search by color. If you're thinking about it like a reviewer, you want to search by brand. And this paper is not really great for painting, but it's font. Why when did all this color transfer happen? Hmm. Well, anyway, not great for painting. It's fine for swatches. And uh, this is a few years old and getting really kind of beaten up. So I need to find a link for the superior palette and I need to try and get a link for the resin watercolor mold. Um, I really appreciate you guys hanging out this evening. It seems like we had a good, oh boy, a bunch of people left. It seems like we had a good stream. I appreciate that. Um, and like people were watching and hanging out. So that's cool. Um, if you guys have any questions, whether it's specific or general, or if you're looking for recommendations, uh, it would be easiest for me now if you send them to me in the art box, uh, the pay box. Let me grab you guys a link and I can uh, answer them after I've had a chance to kind of rest and recuperate. So let me grab a link that doesn't expire. Nice, you're way more organized than I am. I appreciate some, a, a beautiful thing that I would like to have is a poster size swatch sheet of all my watercolors up on my wall. And that's definitely, <laughs> yep, he sure did. They did get tossed when we moved because I wasn't, I wasn't going back to them, you know, um, it was this thing that I had that was useful at the time, but was starting to weigh me down. But after we move, I want to make a big, like maybe wall size <laughs> swatch sheet of what I've got. Cause I'm a very visual person and it'd be nice to be like, oh yeah, I like that color. Okay, so I'm gonna look up and ask a friend about, uh, let, uh, brain is in shutdown mode, yay. So I will try to get the resin mold and I'll go dig up the superior watercolor palette. But I hope you guys have a wonderful week and a happy weekend. Uh, I appreciate y'all letting me just show off all my favorite art supplies and me not having to paint because it is so wet out there. It has been raining just like nonstop for the past week and a half. So I can only imagine how bad the dry time for that would be. Um, and I will hopefully see you guys next, next week, all, all things going well. And I have an art snacks premium to unbox at some point next week. So hopefully I can run a stream for that. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me this evening. I hope you guys have a great night and I'll see you guys again soon. I have I, the Bean Paints unboxing swatch will be live tomorrow. I'm almost done getting that set up. So y'all have a great weekend. Bye guys. Thank you.